Hi, everyone. We are excited to be here. It's June 18th, uh, 2021. Uh, it's during Pride Month and around Juneteenth. And um, it's the last session of the current semester of the Learning Salon. Uh, Learning Salon has been a community for a lot of us during the pandemic, and it's been a fantastic ride. Uh, it's not over. We're going to continue, but it's going to be slightly different because people will actually have a life outside of their homes. <laughs> um, so uh, it's a session where we want to wrap up some of the things that we've discussed over the past semester. And Joe is going to join us shortly. He's uh, probably going to uh, try to make it like time-wise um, work and he will call in. Um, John is here and a number of our previous uh, speakers are in the audience. So it would be a fantastic idea to have a conversation and a wrap-up session. And we're going to uh, end a little earlier than usual. Mm, we're hoping to end by 5.30ish. Fingers crossed. Yeah, which is always famous. Yeah, famous last words. Um, okay. Go on, John. So, yeah, um, it's been incredible that we're really coming up to a year. Um, I think that we have learned a lot. I was saying to Ida in terms of the content and in the form, I think that this has really been radical in terms of the people in the chat, the people who come in, the nature of our speakers, the, the way that we inverted everything from lots of questions and short talks. Um, so I think, it, you know, not having to travel to go to conferences, people can come in from everywhere. So I think there are at least 10 things that we could say are novel and we hope that will change the nature of discourse in uh, academia, uh, which has never been as horizontal as it should be. Uh, so that's great. Um, happy Pride. Um, Happy Juneteenth, and I think we can, we can say Happy Juneteenth for today because it's an official holiday, and of course tomorrow is the actual 19th, so Juneteenth squared. Um, about time, can't believe it wasn't a holiday already. Um, so on that note, um, I think what we'll do is we don't have a talk, um, so we can just dive right in. We're gonna really need people to want to come in and join us, otherwise Ida and I will get very self-conscious while I wait for Jovo. Um, maybe I'll just say a little bit about um, what I think we've discussed and, and what we've learned, or at least what I feel like I've learned. Um, I think one, uh, I think it's incredible when you can get people from AI, systems neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience, psychology, philosophy, uh, to all actually talk together. I mean, it's surprising that it doesn't happen, but we all have our own conferences, we're all siloed, and we tend not to talk each other's language, and we end up missing out because there are whole domains of ideas and rich things that we would like to know about instead of reinventing the wheel. And uh, I think I, for many of you, especially the younger generation you can see how valuable it is to read outside your subject uh how wonderful it is to have in the chat all these different publications flying at you and all these books being mentioned and and, and you know i don't knowing the author of every single paper on every single time when they were written it's slightly disconcerting but for the rest of us we just have to click on them in the chat um so i think scholarship uh being deep and broad has been something that we've definitely learned. Um, with respect to what we've been talking about, I think it, for me, in if, to the degree that I've had a position, which I've been consistent about, uh, almost certainly will end up being wrong, but it's at least the one that I've cleaved to, um, is that intelligence is something that we can see in many forms, in silico uh, uh, and in organisms, and there's an intelligence in a bacterium to a corvid, to a dolphin, to a human. Um, and then there's this particular form of cognition that leads to us having these debates every Friday for a year. And my uh, feeling that we need to have some extra component uh, to explain the difference between intelligence and this peculiar semantic verbal canon and two form of intelligence. Um, I feel like what we've noticed um, in the salon over the last year is that there are some people who feel Tony Zader, I'll make the exemplar, 
who we could extrapolate from the rodent to the primate, to the non-human primate, to the human. Um, I think there are others who feel like the deep learning framework, which has been incredibly good at certain human-like benchmarks, like Atari and like Go, are more likely than the mouse to be extrapolated. Uh, and if someone like Avengio uh, says um, that, you know, that we're doing system one really well in deep neural nets, we now need to do system two. Ida brought my attention to a paper that he wrote, you know, with others about, uh, you know, AI needing a prefrontal cortex. Um, and that leads to the third way, which I think Ida straddles, where she works in the world of AI and neuroscience, where I think that if we understood the computational biology of the prefrontal cortex in humans, that that might give us real insight into this special Kahneman system two semantic verbal type of intelligence uh, that is based on knowledge and out of distribution generalization and one shot learning and all that sort of stuff. So those are the three things. Can we get there from deep neural nets? And can we get there from reinforcement learning uh, approaches to AI? Can we get there from animal models, whether it's a fly or a mouse? Or do we have to study humans um, and learn from them using imaging and modeling and experiments and lesions? And so it's psychology, systems neuroscience, AI. Uh, I think we're all after the same thing if we admit it, not just intelligence, but this peculiar extra human factor. Um, what do I think has won so far? Um, to put it in a crass winner takes all form, um, I'm not sure. Um, I think that the fourth player in that triad, if I may say, is philosophy. And I think philosophy has played the role of pointing out that we have a gap, that we have something that we still need to explain. And perhaps the philosophers articulate the, the lack better than articulating the solution, right? So in other words, what do they say? You know, uh, pathologists are the doctors who know everything but a day too late, right? And maybe philosophers have a little bit of that role is that they can see what's missing, they can see inconsistencies, they can see logical deficiencies, but they may not be able to tell us which of the scientific roads, the systems, neuroscience, the psychology, or the AI to take to try and fill that gap that they so beautifully articulate. Um, so that's the um, where I see uh, we've come to. Um, I don't think we've finished the discussion. Um, I think we've only just started it. I think we've gotten used to each other. I think we've begun to see themes recurring across sessions. Um, I don't think that's repetition. I think it's trying to go back to a problem that deserves revisiting. Um, and I think we should very much continue that. Uh, I think it's fruitful. Um, and on that note, um, I will turn over to Ida, and then anyone who wants to start asking questions either to us or coming in, because it will have to be to us, because it's just us today, um, we should get on with it. Uh, Ida. So thank you, John. I'm going to slowly, if I notice that some of our former speakers are here, just like gradually invite them online. But before that, I just want to say, first of all, Thank you to everybody behind the scenes who has supported us. And this includes Kanaka, Eva, Brad, and especially Claire and Bahar. And I just want to thank them uh, before we start anything. Uh, I just added a list of our speakers in the chat. So just a recap of what has been going on to jog your memory if you want to sort of add a question. And gradually, I will invite some folks uh, on screen. So first, we had Jane Wang, and she told us a little bit about meta-learning across different scales. She showed us some experiments in monkeys and other experiments that their deep learning models of meta-learning could help to capture. Um, in specific, specifically, they had sort of a prefrontal uh, sort of part to their neural networks, and that part could help to generalize what's the rule uh, that can be sort of generalized across a couple of tax tasks, for instance. But her review paper also mentioned that meta-learning could happen at evolutionary scale. So we had a wonderful discussion with Jane. Then we had Sam McDougall, who talked a little bit about applying reinforcement learning to motor learning. Then we had a couple of folks around the same time. We had Kim Stackenfeld, Caswell Berry, and Hugo Spears 
who had uh, applied reinforcement learning uh, to spatial navigation. Um, uh, Kim had um, a model that I work on as well. She had the successful representations explaining the place cells and their eigenvectors explaining grid cells or grid fields. Caswell and Hugo, both of them showed various experiments with rodents and humans for spatial navigation and also modeling that they had done in that domain. It included deep learning models, it included reinforcement learning models, and they showed beautiful data and models. Then we have Katya Hoffman, who told us about um, deep reinforcement learning in games, in realistic games, and how we could create human-like behavior in games, which is a project that I've been involved in. and. You know, we had just the ICML paper that we recorded it yesterday, the talks and the paper is out. And we submitted some more work on that and related to that to NURBS and the work continues. So it's a very interesting, in my opinion, area, given that three, more than three billion people on earth play video games. And so it's now, by now it's a natural habitat, that virtual environment uh, for human behavior. Then we had Randy O'Reilly, a personal, uh, sort of, uh, uh, I would I would say that one of the people in cognitive neuroscience that I stand on the shoulders of, um, he, not only by his own work, but also he has trained some of my mentors, my direct mentors, uh, like Ken Norman. So Randy told us about neural networks and uh, how neural networks can capture uh, prefrontal and parietal networks. Uh, he has uh, done a lot of work in the domain of cognitive neuroscience, and I really recommend uh, for everyone who doesn't know Randy's work to take a look at it and um, um, just the approach, the tool that he provided for the entire community, how to use neural networks in ways that can capture particular functions of the prefrontal cortex, of memory, of the interaction between working memory and episodic memory, I think, and also how, how to connect it to posterior regions functions like the vi visual cortex. Those are sort of fantastic contributions to science, in my opinion, and many others. Uh, Christy Graham then told us about um, uh, uh, learning in primates. So we had this fantastic session where she showed us uh, how they would go to the wild and they would look at the social behaviors of these primates and they particularly look at, for instance, chimpanzees, different sort of signs. And so, for instance, how this could, what this would mean or what different hand gestures would mean in different scenarios. Then we had Chris Honey and he told us about a bunch of different work that they had done in terms of how synchronization between different parts of the brain can be used um, to understand uh, particular behavior, for instance, in movie watching, and also how they had built models of chunking of experience, for instance, into uh, more discrete events that can be parsed or memorized or um, stored in memory. Then we had Jacqueline Gottlieb, who told us about uh, curiosity in human experiments and in other experiments and she told us about exploration and curiosity and the kinds of experiments that they had and we had a wonderful discussion then. Uh, we then had uh, Simon Kornblith who uh, claimed that uh, we just need bigger neural networks with which I disagreed but it was fantastic to hear from him. I think that we might need better architectures as opposed to bigger networks. By the way, at any point, if I'm saying something and it jogs your memory, please feel free to add a question so that we can start the discussion going. Um, then we had Perry Zern and Danny Bassett with a fantastic uh, uh, our session that had two speakers at the same time, they're twins. And the two of them had written a book um, about curiosity and Perry is a professor in um, political science and had worked on the relationship between curiosity and power in the past. And Danny Bassett, of course, all of us know her. Um, so the combination of them to look at the different brain uh, as well as power, social dynamics of um, curiosity was fantastic. Um, then we had Kate Crawford with her fantastic book, uh, The Atlas of AI, where we talked about the um, mining costs for silicon and the um, uh, carbon offset that uh, is sort of generated because of training very large neural networks, how labor changes, how power changes, how governance changes in the presence of AI. And she had created not just a map, so we went from maps in the hippocampus to curiosity 
um, uh, both in the brain and exploring maps around, and then to an atlas or a larger map of how AI is changing sort of um, uh, the landscape of both environmental as well as labor and power dynamics um, in on our planet in uh, uh, the discussions with uh, um, Kate Crawford and her fantastic book, Atlas of AI. Then we had uh, Anima Anand Kumar, and uh, we discussed about her cutting edge work with neural networks and deep learning. We had then Janice Chen, who explained to us uh, various dynamics of people's synchronizations of brains when they are watching the same movie for instance, and uh, various aspects where they uh, analyzed free recall after people had watched a movie um, and compared it to how the representations were encoded in the brain when the people were watching those movies and how those things were activated when they were recalling them and how certain central events in the movie were recalled uh, with less variance as opposed to more variance for less central events in the sort of free recall period, verbal recall period by people. Then we had um, David Barak who had a paper together with John and they told us about different approaches uh, that they saw the community studying the brain. Uh, one approach would be ascribing things more to neurons and uh, their connections as opposed to another approach which would think about representations in terms of emergent multi-dimensional landscapes emerging from multiple neurons and then that's the thing that one analyzes so what is the entity that we need to analyze when we are thinking about representations is it those circuits or is it the sort of emergent sort of representational space um that's uh, that supervenes on those neurons but is now an entity of its own and i think that it has very interesting it, it jogged a lot of very interesting uh, also philosophical discussions about um what is the theoretical entity that we are discussing is it at the neuron level is it at the circuit level or population level or is it at this emergent level where there is some other entities supervening on this and i think that there, there's a lot of very interesting ways to think about that actually then we had Sam Gershman. Sam told us how single uh, cell organisms could potentially learn. And then there was a discussion about what learning could mean. Because as, as you imagine, the learning salon is about the bridges and contentions between biological and artificial learning. And Sam was telling us a lot about situations where learning was occurring in single cell animals. And John was curious whether we should still call this learning and other uh, of others of us we're curious whether this could be the unit or quantum of um, evolution potentially. Um, then we had um, uh, then we had uh, Zena, and Zena told us about some Bayesian approaches and some additions he had made to uh, Bayesian probabilistic approaches, where they could get a little bit closer to uh, reasoning in a logic sort of way, or more similar to a to a to a logical sort of way. And so it was an interesting uh, uh, one perspective on how to bridge simple um, Bayesian principles and derive from or, or connect them to more uh, sort of uh, symbolic like reasoning. Then we had Andrew Whiten, who told us about a potential uh, a sort of presence of culture across all the animal kingdom. Uh, but it seemed like a lot of us were wondering whether some of those behaviors that do seem to show imitation learning or behaviors of various kinds of social learning, whether they 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 were um, sufficiently complex enough to be compared to human culture. And there were different ideas in terms of that gradient. Do we call it a gradient or do we call it a yes or no culture? And there was some discussion about what that gradient could be and what sort of behavior would distinguish um, culture, does the animal need to teach it to offspring, does it need to change or override its instinctive behavior or not, uh, and so on and so forth. Then last week we had the fantastic discussion with Rosa, and Rosa told us a little bit more about um, uh, philosophical perspectives on representation and how they could link with the notions of representation we have in neuroscience. And uh, the beauty of it was that it turned out that our positions might be a little slow, uh, uh, closer to each other than we had anticipated initially. 
Mm, and it, uh, I, I tend to think that she has a philosophical account of how some of us actually think in neuroscience. Um, uh, other than, I guess, for, for some of us, um, sort of the representations could be at different scales and it's easy to consider and use the word uh, representation in posters in a row at SFN or at cosine where you have single cell recordings uh, in the hippocampus in one, uh, manifolds of those uh, multiple cells in another one, then fMRI in another one, then MEG in another one. And we can understand uh, what the, each of those posters means by representation and that they are at different scales across different brain areas or with different modalities of measurement. And um, I think that uh, for some of us who have a computational attitude, we would think that they're, in, they're at some point like there should be a computational model where you could extract the, these different sort of scales of representation from different parts of it. So it's not as kind of um, scattered as one might think. So I think that, that there was a sort of a difference there and I hope that Rosa can come and talk to us if she wanted to further. All right, so that was my summary of all of the talks. John, do you wanna say something about that? You're muted. I definitely want to say something, which is I, I've had it. You didn't rehearse that, did you? So I just don't, uh, I mean, that's just too awesome to be discussed. I don't know how you got through that and remembered all that and synthesized it so well. Um, it's both incredibly impressive and annoying at the same time. You did an amazing job there. Uh, we can all go home. <laughs> um, so that's amazing. I think that really, and I do, and I think that it was such a wonderful crazy and it also, um, really shows that there was a, a theme throughout the salon, that we were really worrying about these notions of, of representation and intelligence, and, um, and that we got really diverse number of perspectives and people, and think about it, you were getting behavior in primates, you were getting learning in bacteria, you had video games and multiple agents. I mean, it's just, I just don't think there has been a conference or a meeting that has ever done this, right? And then you didn't even have to attend all of it. You just got that wonderful summary of it all. Um, so yeah, and I, and I do think that where we disagree, you know, I, I think that it all comes down to um, when can we extrapolate? When can we sort of, as I love that line, sort of the quanta of learning, you know, w w when can we have a building blocks view? And, and when do we have to think about you know, sudden category boundaries where we have to invoke new properties, new concepts that emerge, as Ida said. And um, that's always the debate, right? It happened in physics, and now here we are with it in neuroscience and AI, which is when can we keep turning the knob parametrically and getting new phenomena? Some people have made that claim for GPT-3 that you get these unexpected things in these transformer networks, right? Um, and others, um, who have come on the show and said that we're going to need to combine symbolic approaches with deep learning approaches. So this is the constant debate is when do we find ourselves in a new discipline needing new models and new vocabulary or when can we unexpectedly borrow and extrapolate usefully from ones from what we thought were lower level phenomena. And I think that's come across many times. I mean, for example, in Christie's uh, talk when she was looking in primates, she was admitting, how do we show intentionality in primates? In other words, it, you have to be very ingenious in your experiment to disambiguate a simple sensory motor behavior from an intentional behavior, right? And, and how ingenious the kind of experiments that she was doing are to be able to disambiguate those two things. Um, and what is that? It's saying, look, intentionality, something having semantics, being about something, um, isn't always necessary to explain behavior. And sometimes you can look at a behavior and impose upon it meaning when there isn't. And sometimes there's behavior where one has to have a richer notion of meaning to explain it. And it seems to me that it's really lovely empirical work in, in, in non-human primates and other animals where you can actually try and break that tie. So I think that was really wonderful. Um, okay, oh, we have a brand new guest, someone we've never seen before on the show. Um, you're gonna have to introduce yourself. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Jonathan, thank you. You're uh, basically a, one of our hosts at this point. Um, so without further ado, um, 
Jonathan, what what do you have to say about anything you want, really? Ah, uh, well, mostly I appreciate the uh, learning salon as a forum to bring together diverse perspectives on a single topic. I mean, we have engagements from both the hard sciences, the social sciences, the or in philosophy as well, uh, which allows us to get different perspectives on some of the, these kinds of pertinent issues. And while some of our, uh, say, positions on these might uh, be contentious or in conflict. I appreciate the way the salon allows a forum to actually have these conversations and learn from one another, one another rather than simply looking for uh, positions of refutation. I think uh, insofar as the salon continues to do this, it provides an effective model for collaborative work across disciplines uh, and really reinforces the perspective that uh, a single disciplinary approach might not be able to resolve all of our concerns with a given uh, with a given area of inquiry, and that we need multiple approaches if we're really going to uh, kind of get to the ground of what we're we're talking about. And so that's that's generally one of the most valuable things that I've found about the salon, for, uh, especially as it's informed uh, some of my own work and some of my own ways of thinking about uh, the topics under discussion. I, I learn something new every time I'm here. Uh, so. Your your checks in the mail, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and 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 we have, I can say unequivocally, uh, learned loads from you, um, and uh, I, and and I very much appreciate um, you know that the, you reinforcing the multidisciplinary ambition that we had, which was to have everyone partake in the discussion. Um, and I can assure you, there'll be many people in the chat, Jonathan, who've gone to read their Dewey. <laughs> Did you have a particular thing? Um, maybe now that you have the bully pulpit here, um, when you look back on the salon and what you learned and what you still have questions about or where it intersects with your ongoing concerns. Um, yeah, actually, I think I've learned more about neuroscientific approaches to uh, to learning, to um, interaction with the environment in the salon than any other place that I've done. I mean, you can learn about these things through self-directed study, but I found that learning complicated concepts is much easier, I want to say, in interaction with uh someone who's actually studied and, and done the work on these. And so this is so one of the things that I, I've, I've most appreciated about the salon in as much as we talk about different models of learning, um, the, the pedagogical value of the interactions that we have uh, insofar as it's contributed to uh, new ways of or whole new ways of, of understanding these things. As you said, uh, folks will probably go read their Dewey. For my part, I've gone and read most of the the, the sources cited and linked in uh, the chat during the salon, which has ex wildly expanded the ways that I think about these things. Um, and I think that's, that's the most valuable thing about the salon, the ways that it introduces us uh, to new perspectives and serves as a place to expand our own horizons. Um, I did. Uh, I do appreciate the ways that uh, the salon has not restricted its inquiries to merely uh, artificial intelligence and ma machine learning, but has expanded across uh, all varieties of, of learning, all varieties of consciousness as deployed across fields to look for the intersections. Too often when we start thinking about learning, uh, consciousness, uh, machine intelligence, we find ourselves restricted into particular paradigms and one of the things that the salon has done incredibly well is demonstrated that these are questions that are approached by a variety of fields across a variety of disciplines while still being united by a, a, a kind of singular perspective. So, yeah. I cannot speak highly enough of what you guys have done here. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to dissolve in a puddle of blushing here. So um, we really uh, appreciate it. And uh, you have to... Uh, one, continue to be part of the next season, and uh, any suggestions, by the way, and this is true for everyone, I think, Ida and I would be very interested to hear what, what people have to think about future speakers and future perspectives. Um, 
There is a question, and I, and I think, Ida, correct me if I'm wrong, that the, the question is there, but they couldn't come in. Is that right? So the question is, considering all the different approaches, would you have any advice for early career scientists trying to find the right questions and ask the right problems to solve? Um, that is really hard, right? Um, I think... Um, I think Sam Gershman has a slide set or a, um, a talk that he gives about how to start off right in terms of being true to your questions. Um, what I would say is try and get a bead on what your inner interests are and your curiosities. What do you turn to first in the New York Times science section? What do you find yourself referring to first when you're looking online uh, scientifically, rather than trying to say, well, at the moment, animal models using optogenetics are the thing, and so that's perhaps what I should do. So I think what this salon, I hope, represents is a reading culture, um, a curiosity culture. Obviously, we had a whole session on curiosity. Um, where you shouldn't be ashamed to be into what you're into early on and not postpone it. I think a lot of people that I meet say, once I have tenure, once I get my first R01, once I have my own lab, then I'll start really pursuing what I'm interested in. And it just gets infinitely postponed. It's very similar to what happened, if I dare be political, during the Clinton administration where, well, all those progressive things we'll do in the second term, we'll do it later. Right now we have to be pragmatic, we have to sort of cross the aisle. And you end up being pragmatic and non-aspirational for your whole life because you learn the pragmatic reflexes early rather than the aspirational ones that were closer to what you really cared about. So that's what I would say is you only live once. If you're gonna do science, it's like poetry or art. Do something you really love and don't try and follow the cues from others. I know that's hard, and maybe I'm too much of an old fart to be allowed to say this at this point, but that's what I would suggest, is get aspirational and a bit dreamy early. Don't quell that. Become ultra-hard, metric-based, pragmatic, and then never find your way back to what got you interested in science in the first place. That's, that's what I would say to that question. I would also add that don't underestimate your power as a junior researcher because um, junior researchers are what are the sort of the the blood of science. Uh, science happens at the hands of junior researchers at mostly, and so uh, consider the scientific community a lab collaborations like a neural network, like an architecture. And there, you, there, there is a layer that is connected to actually doing things. And there are other layers that are doing other sorts of computations. And I think that um, maybe there is some point where you might not know exactly, you haven't developed what your exact interests are. It's okay to sort of try different labs, um, but it's extremely important to go somewhere where you feel empowered. If you go somewhere where you're completely disempowered, this might not only damage your sense of doing science, but it might also kind of mm, create other problems and demotivate you for other aspects of your interests or your life. So I would say that um, famous uh, names uh, is, are overrated, but uh, uh, con empowering environments that are conducive to developing your own interests and your own talents are extremely important. And that is, uh, it's not that, not, it's not necessarily that it's not, uh, it's not famous people that do that. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that if somebody has a famous lab, that's not sufficient. You should see if it fits with your, yourself. Sometimes grad students think, oh, I have no other option. Honestly, it's worth to take that extra year off. I don't know, travel, TA, and, uh, even like, you know, be a waiter, whatever it takes. But take more time to find that good lab to enter because it matters a lot for a very long time. Um, and if you, and it doesn't need to be sort of idealistic. So at some point you need to do a stopping for the decision. But I would say that um, choose labs that are empowering, have a social dynamic that will help you grow 
as opposed to just use you as an, an as an instrument for um, producing results within a particular very well known framework. Because in the latter case, uh, the work that you do might not be also credited to yourself. It might be credited to the lab. Um, but in the case where you are empowered to develop your own interests, you will be able to leave your own mark and develop your own style of doing research. And that might be actually a lot more important at the end of the day um, than you know how famous the lab is or how big the publication is initially. As long as you have a couple of publications during a PhD or a couple of projects that are potentially presentable, um, that, that's, that's successful. Um, and it can, it can lead to places. So I know that Melanie asked the question, but I, I have to wait until she comes back because I, this is a big question and I want to make sure. And she says that she's going to be back in five minutes. Um, but uh, uh, if there is anyone else who wants, oh, uh, Elizabeth says in the chat, along John's advice, some great advice from David Bowie, never play to the gallery can be applied to any creative process. Thank you, Elizabeth. I make music a lot. And <laughs> it just so happens that I make the kind of music that I like to make, even if it's not sort of um, what I think people want to hear. So I really appreciate that reference. And uh, yeah, uh, you're welcome, Milad. Um, so, um, there's a nice, you know, mentioning Bowie, the philosopher, the maverick philosopher, Simon Critchley, have a lovely book on Bowie where he sort of meditates on, on, on Bowie's chameleonic changing and his ever-changing interests and, you know, and, and even his sort of sexuality. It's very interesting. So, yes, Bowie, like Prince, actually, they, uh, they just followed their creative genius. Um, and obviously, they're not all geniuses, but you can still try and uh, follow your creativity the way we've been trying to say. Um, is Melanie coming in? Oh, yes. Uh, Melanie, yeah. so Melanie is joining now. Perfect. Hi, Melanie. So great to have you. Um, before we get to Melanie's questions, I would say with regards to the last question, I think one of, in addition to everything that's been said, I think one of the most important things is uh, for early career scientists to maintain their sense of wonder. That is, maintain that sense of, say, uh, awe or that curiosity that has driven them into science in the first place. Um, because once that once that goes, then uh, in my view, the process of science becomes more mechanical, right? And less connected to the, the, the drive for inquiry, the drive for curiosity that animates a lot of really great science. So hold on to that, that sense of wonder, that sense of curiosity that drives one to ask the questions uh that we're we're all exploring that we're considering that is ultimately at the ground of even our most formulaic uh scientific approaches right so hang on to your sense of curiosity and hang on to your sense of wonder uh, because absent that um, it becomes more difficult to to keep going in your inquiry yeah absolutely yeah to you melanie Hi. Hi, Melanie. You know, just one thing. Um, it's a very good thing that you're here and on. It would have been very, very bad form if we were finishing the salon for the summer and you weren't on. So I'm uh, extremely relieved that you're here. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> my, my life is chaotic at the moment because we're moving, but I wanted to make sure I was here. <laughs> I'm going to post this. Um, in the chat, if I can do it, it's not letting me. Oh, I just posted a link. So I ran into this paper, which I think was just released recently by DeepMind called Reward is Enough. Oops. Uh, and it's, it's about, um, it's kind of uh, asserting that reinforcement learning, trial and error learning, trial and error learning, etc. Is, is all we need, you know, uh, to get to AGI um, and that they, they talk about how they're contrasting the view that specialized problem formulations are needed for each ability. And I just wanted, I haven't completely read the paper, but since we have Ida, especially 
who's a reinforcement learning person, I just wanted to get your take on this view. And if if reward is not enough, and we, as we've talked about in the past, we don't really know exactly what reward means, but if reward is not enough, what else do we need? I mean, just before, you know, I, I have read it and I've, and I've, and I've heard David Silver uh, talks and online say this before. Um, and I just think it, you know, I think it's really important to, to, you know, distinguish between what the paper is about and what it's not about, right? Um, there was an interesting podcast recently um, by, and I know I don't remember, by Sanjeev Arora on uh, Brain Inspired, um, where he was talking about the mathematics of deep neural networks. And, you know, there's been this position that if we know the learning algorithm, we know some of the architecture, we know the cost function, that we're on our way. And, you know, and he made the point, just the most recently off the top of my head, is there's a big difference between the, dirt, the journey and understanding the destination. And if you read that paper, then I think they're making the point that perhaps you could pose the problem as a reward-based problem. And I think Ida has pointed out throughout the salon that you've got to be careful about having this monolithic view of what reward is, right? That, it, that, that it's a more, that they're more subtle than that in the reinforcement learning world. So I think what this paper is saying, and I've read it one and a half times, is that there's a way to pose the problem so that the solution of to the problem will come up with a number of features that one would call cognitive. However, the result that you get, the thing at the end of the learning process, and how it actually works at steady state, as Sanjeev Aurora talks about, is a, much, is a very difficult, difficult question to answer, which is why in that Curding and Lillycrap paper, they said, where at best we'll understand how the brain learns rather than understand how the brain works at the end of learning. Okay, and if you read that paper and, I, and you go through it, they talk about the things that will be spat out by certain learning, but they never talk about, well, how is it actually doing it at the end? How does it work? What, what's it doing? That those are, so in other words, learning something and how to formulate the learning problem versus how's it actually doing it when it's all those parameters have been reconfigured and all those connections made, how's it actually doing it is a different question. And I think Aurora is very interesting on this on that latest podcast of Brain Inspired. So I think it might be true. I think I defer to Ida and to Rich Sutton and just how, how much they can and, and Rich Silver, just to finish, has said, I quote, that if you formulate the problem right, in order to be optimal for that cost function, these features will be spat out. They'll come along, right? That's fine, maybe that's true, but that doesn't mean that we understand how those asymptotic final things are working, right? Just like in a supervised learning neural network, we know the supervised learning rule very well. But it's still a bit of a mystery how that neural network at completion has actually done it. And a lot of us, in response, Tim Barron said this on one of the salon shows, is just saying, let's know the learning algorithm, let's know the cost function, let's know the architecture, and we're done. We're just, how the brain learns is enough to ask the question. Well, as Tim said, we'd like to know how it's doing it when it's finished learning, right? And th that paper that you just mentioned doesn't get into that at all, right? So it, it, they're just, half the question has been asked. Is it half or is it only like 1%? I mean, I, I, you know what, I, um, I, 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 I don't know. I just feel like whatever the, whatever the quantitation is, it's let's not make one question look like the meta question, which once answered, answers all that we're interested in. That's my take. If learning is fascinating 
and I defer that it may well be possible to formulate most problems that an organism faced in a sophisticated reward framework. But that is a one particular question. It doesn't tell us how the brain works at the end. It may help us, but it's not primarily what it's trying to ask. So is Rosa here? Rosa was here, so I, um, she's here, but her camera's off. So Rosa, if you wanna respond, sorry, my camera's a little wonky. Let me switch laptops. Okay, we will wait for you. I will kill time until you come back. Uh, John, John, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna. No, I'm, I'm listening to you. I'm just getting water, I promise I'm here. I got it, okay. Watch. So I'm gonna, so. So first, I want to say this before I share some something from my screen, and I'm going to set up. Uh, Melanie, would you mind muting yourself? There's an echo, uh, just for a minute. Just so. Okay, so I just want to say, David Silver, John, I'm going to mute you too, just for echo sake. So there is David Silver, Satinder Singh, Doina Prekup, and Rich Sutton on this paper. These are like very heavy hitters in reinforcement learning. Very heavy hitters and they are all from computer science. So uh, keep in mind that what they are talking about is reinforcement learning as it is applied in computer science, which is a slightly different idea in the sense that um, they, want to, they are talking about, is it enough if I provide the reward that an agent, some reinforcement learning agent could learn the problem, could learn a particular problem, right? But here is my issue as a person who comes from the cognitive neuroscience background. When I go around the world, the world doesn't have a tag of rewards on it. When I talk to a person, uh, there is no tag of when this person is going to be rewarding and when the same person who's been rewarding for a long time might be the opposite, uh, or a person who hasn't been rewarding for a long time might actually end up being rewarding. So none of those things are tagged in the world. And so having some approach for learning those things might be extremely important. And actually, for those of us who ask those kinds of questions, it might be even the most important. And I just want to, like, maybe I will share my, uh, a kind of uh, some, some of the slides of a presentation I gave yesterday in this conference called Evolving Neural Networks, uh, where I was mentioning why we might, need, we might need to move beyond providing the entire reward surface if we want to have a kind of a pl biologically plausible idea of these computational approaches. So it's true that with the reward, so, so, so the answer to do you agree or not, reward is enough, is yes and no. Yes, if we are talking about particular tasks and applying a particular method to solve those tasks, even generalization across a set of tasks, etc. But no, if we want the agent to figure out what's even rewarding, to um, evolve even, uh, maybe other sensory inputs or other uh, architectures so that it can change the notion of reward. And I think that's what happens actually in evolution. And let me see if this works. Sometimes this doesn't work, so it might be a disaster. But let me see if I can make this work. Do you guys see my screen? Okay, perfect. So, so usually I talk about how reinforcement learning can be used to learn representational hierarchy in prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus and whatnot. But then one question that I think relates here is what computational framework can tell us how this architecture even evolved? Like, how did we come up with all of these representations, architectures, et cetera? And I love a, a talk by a previous guest at the Salon, Paul Chizek, where he discusses how uh, different vertebrates, uh, early vertebrates and vertebrates, what kind of things they evolved. For instance, simple foraging evolved, escape circuit evolved, approach circuit, selection between approach avoid. Can we build some kind of a learning principle that we don't define rewards for, but it can forage in an environment to figure out how to survive, how to maintain its homeostasis? That could be an approach, for instance, where we didn't explicitly clarify what reward is, and the animal needs to figure out on its own, like where to sleep where and when to eat, where, how much to eat and how much to sleep to survive. Then, remember Jane Wang, who was one of the authors, uh, one of the speakers in the salon. And she talks about meta learning in natural and artificial agents where at some level it could be a single task. At another level could be a structure of multiple tasks and can be done in a lifetime video game or navigation. Or it could be a highly invariant priors that might get into the architecture 
that happens across uh, evolution. So some primitive, some intuitive physics, etc. Now, what would be the reward definition for these kinds of long-term uh, meta-learning? Is it offspring? Is it how long you will live? Is it how long you and your meta, your your ecosystem survives? Is it lengthening the length of your life? Like, what would we define as the reward there? I personally don't know. Like, I, Melanie, I'd love to hear what you think. Like, what would be the reward there? So I don't know what Rich Sutton or others might think. I think their answer would be, well, we pick one, we simplify the principles, and then we show that it learns. Yes, but that's not what we on the computational cognitive neuroscience side are particularly excited about. We don't know which one of these, right? And there might be some biologically different approaches to get there. And for that, I think, so some people are very much into this idea of, you know, reward maximiz maximization or op uh, optimization. There is some objective function where you need to sort of uh, basically uh, define like a designer god, what is the objective? And then how you also define the architectures, you also define a reward function and methods for what surfaces we can optimize. Um, but, uh, and it's fantastic, it works. So that's the yes part. Yes, this is a great method, but um, it doesn't allow for a kind of an open-ended evolving of neural architecture that are gonna redefine the notion of reward as they develop new architectures or new limbs or new sensors, for instance. And for that, I think we need multi-scale learning like the meta-learning that was mentioned, but we need it to happen in open-ended environments that reward cannot be defined based on one specific theory. And what those theories are, I love this slide from Anna Haratunian that we, she didn't, she was not a speaker at the salon, but I really enjoyed her talk at uh, iClaire, where she looks at uh, theories of motivation across time. And she sort of looks at Plato with appetitive, competitive calculating, the dualistic models, uh, the instinct theory of Darwin, which describes behavior, but doesn't explain behavior. And it goes to what, um, uh, actually it's a good segue to what Rosa was saying in the chat. And then she talks about drive theory of Hall, which is about maintaining homeostasis. But the fact is that we can override our drives and su such a theory wouldn't explain situations where especially us as humans, we override our drives. And then there is incentive theories where you optimize some external incentives. And we all know why that's not a particularly exciting way of capturing human ideas of what drives behavior. So with that, I'm gonna stop here and just like show you this at least I'm not gonna go through the rest of the talk and what I think should be the approach, but I just wanted to show you that I think we can definitely think deeply about the question that you raised, Melanie, um, with regard to, and you know, I don't know how to stop sharing right now. Uh, this is, is this the stop sharing side? Do you, okay, this is embarrassing. Uh, Um, so, uh, Melanie, just again, you know, Ida was actually saying that even from the learning framework, one's going to have to be more sophisticated. But again, I hope it was clear that it happens a lot in the motor control literature, right? There are a lot of people who study motor learning who aren't that interested in motor control, right? They, they basically say, okay, I know how to reach and what learning algorithm do I use to reach more accurately? But if you ask them, well, how do you actually reach? How does your brain make the that's a different question, right? They've already, they start from the assumption that you can reach and now you have a learning algorithm to improve your reaching. But that's a different, but if you can have a whole career talking about how you improve your reaching accuracy without ever explaining how reaching itself is generated, okay? And I think that's the distinction. I'm interested in the final product. How do you do the thing that you learned towards? And that's a different question. You see, they're just, it's just not addressed. But I also wonder, is, is this equivalent to all the arguments that like something is computation universal, you know, it's equivalent to a universal computer. So in principle, you could compute anything. So is, is reward, you know, reward is all you need, saying that in principle, it can learn anything, but, you know, in practice, maybe it will take, uh, you know, Longer than the universe, is it, or is there something more deep about this argument that they're making? I, I think the, the 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 deep thing would be is that I mean, let's be very clear what the deep implication of what they're saying is that 
if you know ever more sophisticated reinforcement learning algorithms can be brought come come along, then we'll get to AGI. Right? In other words, that's what they're they're saying that what they're doing at DeepMind keep going, and we'll get AGI. I mean, that's the implication of what they're saying is that we don't have to. You know, I mean, Ida also doesn't agree, but they're saying we don't really need to introduce any new ingredients qualitatively to end up getting these things. Now, that's a huge claim, right? Well, I mean, well, well, limited limited amount. Amount. well anyway. right. and, and I, I just think it, I don't think, think it's right, right either yeah. from the point of view that this is the universal algorithm that we can get to it. And also, even if it were, we'd still be left wanting to know what the product, how the product works at the end of the learning. So I think it's wrong and wrong but but there are, but there are two different ways that it's wrong is what I would say. We should let Rosa say something. <laughs> Rosa, go ahead. Um, so I, I was just trying to think this through in the chat. Um, I, I've only um, read the paper quickly, but uh, it does seem like there there's something a little circular about the idea that reward is enough, depending on how we understand. Reward. So, um, so maybe another way of thinking about the claim reward is enough is that if you're successful enough, if you're successful at any sufficiently complex task, um, and that task itself requires intelligence, then being successful at that task will involve you having intelligence. Um, then there's the second part: uh, is reward in fact enough to produce success at that task? And it seems like that's kind of an empirical question uh, that we don't have the answer to for lots of the rewards that we've actually tried. So I, I guess it, it doesn't seem like it's a substantive claim to say that reward is enough. If what you mean by reward is being able to perform some intelligence involving task, because of course being able to perform some intelligence involving task is sufficient for having intelligence. And it also comes to be your question, Rosa, with, you know, you could argue that natural selection and the theory of evolution can be described in a fairly compressed form, sure. In fact, Darwin throughout his writings would always say in various locations in his books, I'm going to sidestep how the thing works, but I can show you why it's adaptive and why it might be useful to have it. So Darwin himself thought, look, the evolutionary process and being able to describe it in a compressed form isn't answering the question of how does the bloody thing work at the end? You know, he might be able to tell us. So Darwin, right there, was talking about this dichotomous way of asking the question. So I, I, I think that, you know, there are probably many people will say that it's not enough to consider it as the algorithm. And also that it still leaves unanswered how the structure at the end of the process actually works. <laughs> Right? I'd like to know how a giraffe's neck swallows. Yeah, and it's very interesting to know that it's good to have a long neck because you can reach the highest tree, but whatever you want to know how it actually swallows, <laughs> right? That's a different question, right, Melanie? I mean, I think the same kind of question actually arises in the context of evolution where um, in, on some ways of stating um, evolution by natural selection, it seems like a tautologous principle, right? Because it essentially says the fittest things the things that survive, survive. Right? And, and this leads to all kinds of you know, interesting consequences um, in the actual world. But the, the actual principle just seems to say the things that are more fit are going to be more fit, i.e. have more offspring and be around for longer. And I think something similar is going on uh, with the statement of reward, right? The things that are good at things are going to be good at things. And yeah. in that way, it's not very surprising. So there's gotta be a more interesting formulation there. But you would agree that if those, if, if, if they at DeepMind were to say that we're just going to apply the kind of approaches we've been applying and suddenly, voila, we have AGI, then the egg is on our face. Right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, Tim, before you disappear again, it seems like you're fragile. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can hear you. We can hear you. Yeah. Um, good. Okay. 
Um, so uh, I missed most of this conversation. I'm sorry because I was watching England play football. Um, quite disappointingly. What happened? Um, what happened? Did Scotland win? But, um, not at all. But but England were very good. Uh, England were pretty slow everywhere. Anyway. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, the question is: uh, Is reward is enough? Uh, presumably. Um, and uh, I. Um, I don't know. I, I suppose whenever I hear something like this, I always think of asking Wolfram Schultz what reward is. And Wolf, I mean, Wolfram Schultz's re response to what reward is, is anything that makes the animal approach. And so we, we, get, in, we get into a sort of uh, circular debate about what, if you don't know what reward is until you watch what the agent's doing, then it's quite difficult to know. Um, I think this, this yeah, I, I feel like um, in an, in a, more general environment that isn't a computer game where there isn't quite so much um, defined as reward and reward is really about um, uh, evolutionary fitness it's much harder to uh, it's very hard for me to imagine how you can get these kind of complex behaviors uh, where you where in a world where the experimenter or the designer has to define what the reward function is um, uh, that, that's I guess one thing that I would one comment I would make um, which is different between biology and AI and re reinforcement learning. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if you can, uh, if you can tell me what my reward function is, then maybe DeepMind could, could, could produce me, but, but you can't hear me. Can't hear me, oh, we can hear, hear you. There is a delay. So I think what they said was in the beginning of what you were talking that was a little more quiet. Now your voice is good. So, uh, I, I, all I'm really saying is uh, at the moment, before I've sort of considered it more deeply, is, is even if you, we could do the rest of it, given the reward function, I'm not sure how trivial it is to def define a reward function um, that is um, that, that that will produce something useful. Does that make sense to anybody? Um. I tend to agree with with Tim because um, defining the reward function is actually not easy, especially the more complex the tasks become. And discovering that shape of the reward function becomes extremely difficult. And so, and, and uh, having an agent that actually, hi Jovo, uh, we're gonna bring you on screen uh, soon. So uh, to have a kind of an agent that can learn the shape of rewards based on just interacting with the world, like imagine going to a new planet, you don't know what's edible, you don't know what animals are predators and which ones are, you know, you can eat them, you don't know which plants are poisonous or are gonna eat you and which plants you can eat. You have to gradually interact with the world to figure that out. And so I feel like that's the kind, yeah. Uh, I, I suppose another way of saying this is that the um, brain uh, doesn't, isn't given a reward function. It has to figure its own reward function out. And so, and so uh, even a right. uh, reward, yeah. Even right, if the exactly. reward enough, is enough, it, it, I've got, I've got, you've got this weird echo, sorry. Mm -hmm. We don't hear an echo. I'll tell you what, guys. I, I'm, I'm going to log off and I'm going to log back on on Chrome and see if it's better. Gotcha. We didn't hear an echo for you, so just so you know. Um, just to follow up on what, 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 what we were just saying, um, I think it's important that the brain... So initially, there was no reward function given as, the, as sort of the, the evolution of neural architectures was happening. Gradually, some kind of um, biases and some kind of priors went into the architecture and they helped later on to make things easier. So for instance, um, we know even now in uh, epigenetics that like uh, you scare a rodent from some smell and then its offspring might be scared of those smell even though the offspring didn't have a negative experience with it. Or as humans, we prefer to eat plants that are not very dark, like that's kind of some kind of architectural prior or something like that, who knows, or maybe it's cultural. Um, but animals ha do come at after a while, the architecture start to accumulate some kind of priors, 
But that is also learned at evolutionary scale or meta learned at evolutionary scale. At least that's how I see it. So going back to Jane Wang's like three different scales of meta learning, after a while, some of those things that uh, the, initially there was no notion that these are rewards, some things might go as priors into the brain. Uh, but that is also learned, meta learned over evolutionary scale. But I'm going to go back to Tim, who, who's, who has returned. I think this is better. Is this better? Sorry about that. That was a bit of a um, uh, safari error. Uh, good. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so what I was saying, I mean, maybe you guys heard this. Or um, uh, so uh, it's 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 non. It, it's non-trivial to define the reward function. The brain has to define its, it has to evolve its own reward function. Um, maybe um, uh, if you had the reward function, then you could uh, learn something that was that was useful. Um, but um, my yeah, I mean, it's not hundred percent clear to me that the problem is well. Well, I don't know what Ida thinks about this, but but like, let's say so. Yeah, it's it's not it's not completely clear to me that the, the the problem of survival is is that well that well um, uh, posed uh, it, it, like survival in a complex um, uh, society with with um, uh, where where you have to be um, engaging in all sorts of uh, complicated social behaviors. Uh, Etc. Is that well posed as a simple reinforcement learning problem with a reward function, which or a static reward function, for example? Now, I think, I think that the um, uh, it, this always comes to back back to, to the fact that almost any way that you could express this thing could be like translated into a reinforcement learning. Um, uh, you can have equivalent equations for reinforcement learning versus almost any other thing that you want. And so, um, and so, with so, so, I think that you can make an argument that reward is enough if you've got the right um, uh, re reward function always. Uh, but I always, but I think that often think that um, that just puts the pressure on making very complicated, difficult reward functions for the reinforcement learning agent. So, I mean. I realize I'm sort of waffling and, and not being clear. So let me just try to be a little bit clear about an example like this. So um, let's say you're engaged in a, in a game where, where, um, uh, where there's, no, there's no money or, or anything uh, in an fMRI scanner, for example. And you can say, well, uh, there isn't any reward here. So your stratum shouldn't be active. And then someone could say, well, actually, being correct is an internal reward, and people just like being right. Um, and that, so, so obviously that's true. And so you can get the same brain signals for being right as you can for eating chocolate or getting money. Um, but it would be difficult to figure out what all of those uh, internal reward functions, uh, rewards should look like if you were going to train a reinforcement learner on those things, if there weren't any chocolate. I, I guess that's what I think. You muted, John. John, I think you might be muted. Yeah, you're being very gracious at the moment. I mean, I think. Let me just give an example, right? Um, you you could frame everything. Um, uh, Tim goes to war because it's an honourable thing to die for your country, right? Exactly. And then you say, well, for Tim, the most rewarding thing is to feel a sense of honour, right? Now, what is that explained? Nothing. Right. What you want to understand is what is honor. What is what is it to understand the meaning of that? So, in other words, you could frame almost any bit. Why does Melanie want to be a professor at the Santa Fe Institute? Well, because she likes collaborating with other scientists and has a question. I mean, the thing is, oh, Melanie finds it rewarding to collaborate. I mean, it it it's a banality ultimately if you frame everything in that way. So. It, it's not so much, so I think that when it comes to the sort of examples that Ida gave of going to a planet and having to explore and work out what's good and what's bad, in other words, there are problems that have more of a video game-like quality where an implicit learning mechanism that is reinforcement with the right cost function can get you quite a long way. But there's an entire world of inference and thinking and meaning and what we're just discussing 
Well, it just doesn't help at all to understand it. Do you see? So isn't that what the real issue is? Is of course I can say honor's rewarding, collaboration is rewarding, being on the salon is rewarding. What have so, I said? So, so so but let's take the count the counter example where, for example, DeepMind will train um uh like populations of agents to fight against each other forever and then and see and then the ones that that win uh survive and get to fight against the next set of people and now the reward function is quite well defined it's just do you win the fight or not and then inside each of those people's each inside each of those agents brain they find something which looks a bit like honor but they um, won't in, i mean I'm, the, I'm saying, you see, that's what i'm saying is when you say it will look a bit like honor well, well, they'll find they'll find neurons that like dying in favor of their team winning. Right, and then, we will and then we will anthropomorphize that. <laughs> yeah. by team in honor. John, I'm on Tim's side that what you think is the most challenging part is not the most challenging part. In, in, I agree with Tim that it's it's um, possible to generate particular. And actually, they've done this. Like you know, you evolve particular multi agents that. Uh, the agent that can give the most amount of correct information to others gains influence and, and the other agents are more likely, for instance, to give it information and get information from it. So this is beautiful work that has been done already. Um, but so I don't think the parts that you think are the difficult parts are the difficult parts as much. But what Melanie was capturing, in my opinion, is, is a little bit maybe closer. Uh, the, defining the reward functions becomes extremely difficult. Uh, the more complex the behavior becomes. However, at the same time, sometimes they define a very simple objective or very simple task, and then it does a lot of things. And so those are the kinds of things that there is like, oh, here's our victory. Look, we just defined the simple objective and all of these things emerged, right? Here is the challenge even then, and I'm here, I'm with Tim again, that um, it's true that you could get those kinds of things locally, but defining all of those little objectives for all of the different aspects of biological life, let alone complex human social life, that's, it's gonna be like crazy. Basically, you're gonna be godding the, 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 the reward functions a lot, right? So in fact, the most difficult thing, John, might be actually defining those reward functions. And I love what Melanie said a couple of kind of uh, messages up where she says, and I'm trying to quote, it seems like reward function is harder to model the more complex the agent's intelligence is. Could this be a measure of intelligence? Like how difficult is it to capture the reward function in order for our models to learn it? Because reward is enough for it to learn it once you define the reward, right? Right. No, I, agree. Agree. I would agree, I would agree either, that, that, that if you said my goal, let's go back to the Greeks, is to lead a virtuous life. What's the reward function for that? So as Tim was saying, it's quite possible to define a particular set of rules and have that thing emerge. And then they would say, look, this particular node is choosing less money than more because it's trying to be more uh, equitable and shares its money with others. Or look, they tried it on the prisoner's dilemma. Or look, they also put it on a trolley problem and it's like performing such and such. They can definitely des design a set of tasks and say, hey, we gave this objective function and this kind of behavior emerged in like some of our, our agents, right? Tim. Uh, so so, um, so I, I think that maybe there's an interesting dichotomy here because I, I think you probably could design a reward function which over many, many generations pr produced a reward function at the population level which over many, many generations produced individuals that like virtu that vir vir is vir virtuosity or vir vir Virtuousness. It's not the same as virtuous. Oh, too late. Anyway, um, uh, what's the noun for, for virtuous? Anyway, the um, uh, the but how, however, uh, the the um, it, it, it's also uh, I think uh, true that um, the, that that's not the same as saying that that's how humans developed it. Right? There's no sense in which. Um, uh, many generations evolved uh, uh, virtuousness in the Greeks, but not in the Spart in the Athenians, but not in the Spartans or whichever way around it was, right? Because those generations were all totally mixed together. There was some uh, communal discussion with which um, idealism, which led to simulate heroic future. It's a thing that it's difficult to imagine how uh, reinforcement learning, as we think of it now, 
could produce that kind of emergent behavior, I, I think. Um, uh, and by but, the way, yeah. by the way, even if, and you know, you, you, I've heard the word emergent many times, which means that, like I said at the very beginning when Melanie asked her question, even if it were true, and you know, there's been some skepticism about defining reward functions, how would you do it? When you use the word emergent, you're saying you now have a property, let's call it virtue. Well, now our job is going to explain, well, how on earth is that working? Right, so in other words, yes, let's say it shows up and a reward function allowed it to show up. Well, I want to know how that works, right? I don't want to know just how it popped up. So in other words, that's the other issue, right? In other words, I'm, I'm not really satisfied with the curding and lily crap saying, be happy that you've identified the learning and leave it at that. Would you agree, Tim, that it doesn't answer how the thing is actually doing its specialized virtue function as it is. Yeah, we're, in, we're into, um, so I uh, happen to agree with you that I don't find uh, it satisfying just to know the learning, learning algorithm and the architecture, but I don't know what my um, academic uh, like, uh, like the next generation, and the, I, 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 I feel like what you want, I feel like a, a manifold is, is attractive to people who've been brought up with manifolds in the same way that a synapse has been is attractive to people who've been brought up with synapses and maybe if you learn to think in architectures and learning algorithms that might actually have explanatory power in the way a synapse has for john and a manifold has for me and or etc et i mean i feel like i feel like i i don't i don't this like this argument about what you can intuit with is the is the um uh, is the key and obviously um some people will be able to intuit with architectures and learning algorithms. So I didn't find that a very powerful argument, although for me, I agree with you. Um, so, so just to summarize, um, Melanie, for those of you who didn't, who weren't here from the beginning, Melanie uh, sent a paper from uh, David Silver, Satinder mm -hmm. Singh, Doina Precup, Richard Sutton, um, which is called a Reward is Enough. It was published in Artificial Intelligence recently, it's 2021. These are very heavy hitters in computer science in reinforcement learning, all of them. Rich Sutton is basically the, the grandfather of reinforcement learning for all of us. All of us read Rich Sutton's work to basically learn about um, reinforcement learning. Doina Precup works on hierarchical reinforcement learning. Satinder Singh, uh, one of my co-authors, has done like so much, has contributed so many different algorithms to reinforcement learning. And David Silver at DeepMind is uh, one of the people behind, uh, for instance, um, Alpha Star and various other kinds of uh, algorithms that you might have heard of. They wrote this paper and their claim in this paper, which we have pasted in the chat, but if you have just arrived, I'm going to paste it in the chat again. The claim is that uh, you can have, you can define uh, uh, the reward enough hypothesis postulates that intelligence and its associated abilities can be understood as subserving the maximization of reward by an agent acting in an environment. So the idea is that a squirrel, for instance, acts so as to maximize its consumption of food, which I don't think so, because otherwise we would all die, because if we eat too much, we actually are going to die. I don't think I maximize food when I eat food. Um, so uh, I think that, for instance, maintaining homeostasis is not about maximizing food, but they will say, oh, we can reframe the reward function so that it enables maintaining homeostasis. And then you would say, but this and that, they would say, okay, I will reframe the reward function and then it can solve it. So they are right. If we reframe the reward function enough, many things can be learned with reinforcement learning. But here's the challenge as Melanie was mentioning, and I wanna hear from Melanie after this. Melanie was suggesting after uh, Tim and I were uh, offering this idea that you know, evolutionarily, we didn't, we, the, like the first bacteria, they, it wasn't that the notion of define was derived. There was just like, you know, movement and then gradually it was movement towards the direction of a gradient and then random movements when there was no gradient. Gradually different kind of sensory and motor limbs and sort of sensors evolved and then the movements could be a little bit more towards foraging. There could be approach and avoidance there, you know. At some point, one one cellular organism ate another one. It became two, and multicellular organisms started. So there is a bunch of beautiful work that actually, uh, a beautiful sort of uh, work that has discussed this. And I'm looking for the book. It's not oh right here. It's always on my desk. So I recommend any book by Peter Godfrey Smith. This one is Metazoa. Um, discusses these sorts of evolutionary sort of uh, scales that happen. 
Now, meta learning over the course of evolution might put some priors in the architecture, in the neural architecture that's evolving uh, for some priors, but still the animal is capable of just approaching things and testing things out and exploring things that it didn't know. It has no prior whether these are rewarding or not and learning new things. And if it develops new limbs or new sensors, it, it would need to sort of also incorporate that into the architecture over meta learning over evolutionary scale. So in that sense, even when reward is innate, it has been learned over evolutionary scales, or at least that's the claim that I would make. And uh, Melanie was then saying, maybe then the le measure of complexity of intelligence is how difficult it is to define a reward function. And I want to hear from Melanie because uh, uh, this is what she was suggesting in the chat. And there are also questions from Melanie in the chat, Melanie, so you're under siege here about, I think from Jovo actually, is do you think we're going to get meaning from reward functions? Let's go one by one. I feel like, to be honest, that question is another branch. And uh, let's, let's get back to first the basic questions that Melanie was asking, I think are very fundamental. And I think this paper that she suggested is, is very fundamental. Let's go to that. But I want to hear, Melanie, on this particular idea that defining the reward function might be a measure of the complexity of intelligence. Well, I just kind of suggested that off the top of my head, just listening to you talk about bacteria and so on, because it clearly seems like to understand bacteria, reward is enough. You know, you can actually make sense of it. But as you go up the sort of scale of intelligence if something exists um, in terms of complexity, it just seems harder and harder because reward just gets much more fuzzy. Uh, it's sort of what it actually means. And there's no single reward. You know, John said, well, what does it mean to want to live a virtu uh, virtuous life, right? And I, I, I want to live a virtuous life. That's one of my goals, but I'm, I also have a lot of other conf conflicting, contradictory desires. <laughs> and that go, that thwarts me all the time. Uh, and that's because I'm much more complex than a bacteria. At least I like to think so. Um, so I, I think that that's, that's just a, it was just kind of a off the cuff idea that, that, that that's one measure of our complexity is how hard it is to understand or to model our reward function, if that even means anything. I don't think we have a reward function, if you will. But I was also just going to push back a little bit on John. Um, John's been saying, well, they've kind of, they're saying that they can explain the learning part of it, but what happens once it's you've learned, you can't explain how it works. But I'm just wondering if they would, and I tend to agree with you, but if they would counter, well, the learning part is, is, is how it works. There's no sort of separation between learning, you know, sort of offline learning and then online performance. That reward is what is, kind of goes all the way down. Uh, there, that, that you're making this artificial separation. It's so. not an artificial, let me give you an example. It's not an artificial separation. I mean, I certainly don't think so. Let me give you an example. Um, Amy Bastian has done some very beautiful work um, showing that um, adaptation on a strip belt treadmill uh, seems to be completely intact um, in a patient with a hemiparesis versus a, a healthy person. And you can study learning and you can show both the patient and the control subject learn in a very similar way. And you can show that they're using the same algorithm. But, and that's fine, and you can actually make them improve, but it tells you nothing about what the motor control abnormality is that the paretic limb has, right? It's, a, it's just a different question. If you ask somebody who did that experiment, okay, the learning algorithm was intact in both, so why are they different in terms of their motor control, right? They're di it's a different question. In other words, and, and in fact, you know, it just doesn't, it seems to me fundamental that the, the, the bracketed system upon which learning rules operate, you have to take that for granted. You have to say you've got movements and now you can adapt those movements and you take it for granted that you've got the basic physiology to do the movements that you now do the learning on top of. But if you ask, well, I know about the error for adaptation, but tell me how muscles get activated by the brain. It's a different question. 
even though well, this, may, this may go back to what I just said about the authors being computer scientists. They're not neuroscientists. So they don't, maybe they don't care. They don't care if they Well, I mean, I don't care what they don't care about, right? I'm just saying that there's a question left, which a lot of neuroscientists care about, which is how is this thing doing its functional thing at steady state? <laughs> right. <laughs> Ida just said, um, they don't care that you don't care what they don't care about. <laughs> Yes, and we can go on ad infinitum. <laughs> yeah. So one, one oh go sorry. Um, one thing that you know struck me about modern reinforcement le learning, it, you know, symbolic AI for many decades it ignored perception. It was like per there's a perception module, and then there's our thing that we're gonna, you know, take input from the perception module that does the representation, then we act on the representation. And I'm wondering if that's sort of happening in reinforcement learning too, that they're kind of ignoring the complexity of perception, that they're saying, okay, well, we have this thing called a state that we begin with, and we somehow figure out what the state is. And then once you have the state and you have the reward, then you can do everything. But really the hardest part is figuring out kind of the perceptual part that, that, that says I'm in a particular kind of state and you can do that with things like playing chess or go but in the real world that's um, that's so much more complex and is that is it is this like more of X paradox again I do want to hear again about what you were uh, uh, what you were saying earlier that at the bacteria level maybe just calling the gradients of food reward is enough but uh, as we go higher uh, maybe the reward function the shape of the reward function becomes very complex um, so what what do you think about task specific versus sort of multitask sort of reward functions well I don't even know if a reward function is the way to think about it um, <laughs> You know, it may be that that whole sort of, um, I don't even know if it's a metaphor with a mathematical concept is, is leading us in the right direction. That we're not really driven by, there's not some, some sort of function that we can define. But it does seem like if there is, it's gonna be a very complicated function that has to do with a lot of, you know, <laughs> You know, it's all about, it, fundamentally, you, you can break everything down to s surviving and reproducing, right? That's what evolution does. I mean, but, but, it could be that it's not survival, however, at the individual level. It could be at the species level, or it could be not at the species level, but at the ecosystem level. And I think it's a huge difference where you draw the objective function for survival. So I don't think it's so easy because, um, you know, ecosystems can evolve, can survive together. Like if you have a lot of wolves, but no sheep, they're not gonna survive. If you have a lot of um, sheep, but no grass, they're not gonna survive. So it, you can't have more sheep than there is a reproduction of grass, and you can't have more wolves than the reproduction of sheep. So there is a particular equilibrium that can happen only in this kind of a multi-agent setting. And in that sense, it's not just the survival of individual that can be mentioned as the objective because it might not end up learning things uh, the right way if it doesn't take into consideration other things at the meta learning level. And at the same time, evolution is blind. It doesn't really have a meta learner the way we have it in computer science where you can roll the dice so many times and see what parameters you learn from it, right? So it's kind of like an experiment that's ongoing. You roll the dice and some things just don't survive and maybe with a different parameter, they could have survived, but they didn't. You know, it's not that they are in all the possible ways they were not, um, they couldn't survive. It's just with the current parameters, they didn't. Are you losing voice, sound, Melanie? Okay, Tim wanted to say something, so, or Rosa. Tim? Melanie, we can't hear you anymore for some reason. Uh, I'm, I'm <laughs> I, I, didn't want, I didn't want to say anything about it again. I've also got a strange echo again, and so it's not working quite so well today as normal. Um, the, so 
at the same time as that reward is not enough current paper coming out there were a couple of papers coming out of berkeley that were quite interesting i thought saying that um reinforcement learning doesn't exist uh saying that it's all you can do the whole thing with sequence learning no one's maximizing reward they're just trying to predict sequences and reward is just another thing that you're trying to predict um and to some extent i found that um quite an appealing um option uh, as well and so if you know how to predict uh, rewards uh, with your sequences you can go and you can go grab those rewards and I, I have a um, in some ways uh, um, just regarding reward as one other thing that's that's around there uh, in the world <clears throat> is easier than it being a special thing that you have to define uh, and also I, I feel like it is makes it uh, makes it um, uh, easier to understand like behavior in the context of all the other things cortex like like um, reward guided behavior in the context of the other things that happen in cortex like um, like speak like language or like uh, prediction um, so I wondered I don't know maybe no one else saw these papers but um, uh, or maybe um, did you see them either or is it wh whose lab is it from Sergey Levin or uh, I think that he was one of them and the other one was I, I can probably find them but um, um, yeah we would really appreciate if you put it in the chat because we really oh is it that one that someone put in the chat decision transformer uh, I, I click on, click on it. it yeah that's, yeah, that's, that's one, one of them exactly. and the other yeah, one is exactly. exactly. and they, they, they say very similar things they basically say don't bother doing reinforcement learning at all just do sequence learning <laughs> thank you for bringing it up it's important to have the kind of the the different perspectives i totally agree with you um two uh so do you do you want to try again melanie now that you're back can you hear me sorry i technical problems but um and i can't even remember what I was saying, but Rosa just asked, what is sequence learning? Good question. So, <laughs> so, so like language models just try to predict the next thing that happens without any, without one, without having any special thing like reward or trying to maximize reward or whatever. But if, if one of the things that could happen is a, is a reward and then you, so like imagine a language model and then trying to, trying to optimize the language model for predicting the word Roger or something like that. And then it can tell you the likely sequences of texts that would have Roger and probably there'd be a jolly before it or something. Well, in the same way that you could, you, you could just show it sequences of things that uh, of behavior, of actions or behaviors. And some of the things that it could see could be called Roger or reward or something like that. And then you can say, well, go and go and find me a sequence that, that had that Roger in it or that reward in it. And then <laughs> and then um, and, and uh, now, though, now you can be much more flexible. And so you can just you can go and find a sequence with anything in it. Um, and it just happens to be the reward that you want right now. Great. Um, but it's a very, very different spirit from how reinforcement it's. There's no there's no idea of a value. There's no idea of a prediction error. There's no idea of anything. There's no idea of credit assignment. There's, no, there's not none of these things that are all the keys to David Silver and Richard Sutton. They just don't exist in this world. It's just you're just literally trying to predict the sequences, your sensory experiences, and one, one of, those of those things happens to have an R next to it, and and but, but, and you can go and um, you can go and find the sequences with lots of R's in, and that will innately uh, buy you some reward, and so in. Some, somehow in that in that view reinforcement learning is not at all special and it and it's just something like so, saying something like all of cortex is doing or all of well, all the brain maybe but but in some sense all of cortex is doing sequence prediction um and um uh and that looks like reinforcement learning um I yeah. and yeah, I just thought it's an interesting counterpoint to this other this other paper that came out so i thought i'd raise it but would you agree just just Tim, just to be clear, right, let's say that sequence learning is a superordinate term and reinforcement learning is a subordinate version of it, right? Um, 
Well, but, well reinforcement, reinforcement learning has done. So, I mean, you, if you say that, then you uh, ignore what how reinforcement learning has been done. So, reinforcement learning has been done about computing a value function and um, try and um, or a policy, uh, defining a state space, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and um, all of that is, just doesn't exist in this, this other way of thinking about it. If you think that um, reinforcement learning is just any piece of machine learning that finds rewards, then I agree this is like a, a, a subset of reinforcement learning. But all of the mathematics that, that David Silver is worried about or, or, or Richard Sutton is worried about just don't exist in this other way of thinking about it. Yeah, exactly. But another, if you're trying to, you know, like in, you know, GPT-3 predict the next word, I mean, would you agree that you know, in the philosophy of science, prediction and understanding have been considered quite different? So, um, and there's a lot of work on that, you know, quantum mechanics, for example. Um, Sean Carroll recently on a podcast was saying that a whole generation of physicists were brainwashed into thinking that quantum mechanics was kind of just predicted and you didn't understand it. And of course, there's been a backlash against that. So just taking that as an analogy, understanding and predicting are different things and the brain understands things, at least the human one does. It doesn't just predict things. So are you saying that this framework is gonna work for understanding and meaning like Melanie talks about or just prediction? No, no, I, Sorry, I, I, wait a second. I, I, yeah, go on, go on. I, I wasn't thinking, I was just, I was just um, interested. I, all I was doing was noting that within a very short period of time, um, there was one machine learning paper saying everything that you need is reinforcement learning and there were some other very influential machine learning papers saying you don't need reinforcement learning. So I was, that, that, that's all I was Sure, that, sure. All but then, but, but all, and all I was saying is that one could come up with a paper <laughs> is to say all we need is sequence learning. Yeah. No, no, no. So I'm, 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 not, I'm totally not suggesting, and nobody, I think, has, suge has suggested that. I'm just saying that, that I, I suppose I, I, I'm saying that just because DeepMind write a paper saying all you need is reinforcement learning, doesn't mean we should necessarily believe them, given that other people have just written, uh, equally influential people have just written a paper saying no one needs reinforcement learning. <laughs> so, I mean, one thing I would say, to be fair, is that when there is an optimization, when there is an objective function, there is some kind of an implicit notion that's similar. For the purposes of John, the broad notions that uh, he's considering there still needs to be some kind of uh, some kind of a notion of optimization defined even in sequence learning. Another thing that I would say for the purposes of John, or, or uh, John like as an abstract uh, entity of second person in a discussion, uh, with that perspective, um, the particular mathematical approaches that are used in sequence learning, some very similar approaches are used in some other representation learning and reinforcement learning. And for the purposes of these discussions, there is nothing more uh, meaning laden in any of these approaches than the other. They are all just I agree. I agree. yeah. So that was not the claim at all. I think Tim's point was a, a, a much more sort of specific point, which he was saying. Somebody might say reward is enough. Somebody else might say sequence is enough. Somebody else says LSTMs are enough. Somebody says transformers are enough. Uh, somebody says just predicting the next thing is enough because of GPT three. The computer science, like there was like a, a comic that people were making about the types of computer science papers. And one of them is such and such is enough. Another one is saying such and such is not enough. Another one is saying the ultimate benchmark for this. Another one saying the, the, uh, the you know, a critique of the benchmark. So another one is a review of like what doesn't. So there's just like particular templates, the same way that songs have like an intro and a verse and like a chorus. There are particular things that we know and they, they serve a particular function. But I think that it's um, this discussion has been interesting, especially I'm sorry that Melanie left, but um, it, it highlights how important it is, whether it's the objective function in a sequence learning, whether it's optimization approach and the surface that you assume, because there's so many assumptions that uh, machine learning people make even for sequence learning. Whether it's, what assumption do you make about the surface? Uh, I think that Rosa in some of her, uh, one of her talks actually even had a slide that was mentioning the assumptions that people make about the surface of errors, if I don't, if, if I remember correctly. Um, so what, what do they think the surface of error looks like? What, how should we optimize the surface of errors, for instance? 
That's very similar. It's a similar notion. It just has different, it, it appears in different masks, but it's the same person. <laughs> and this, or the same, I'm not, I didn't mean to personify it, the same concept. And that concept is very similar to the idea of defining some kind of a reward slash error slash objective surface. And the whole point that I think uh, I'm making, and I, if I understood correctly, uh, Tim was agreeing with, is that that surface in us, in our architectures, and whether it's in, like the inherited in architecture or learned socially, that is learned. So we evolved those, those surfaces. We socially uh, learned those surfaces. Uh, on top of the rewards of the of the evolved surface that was like maybe in our architecture as a bias, right? Uh, Jovo seems to be like more vocal now that he's in the audience. Maybe we should bring him on screen just well, so yeah, that he. Can... Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Rosa, did you want to say something? Or no, uh, uh, Flowers wanted to say something about Plato. I think. Yeah, I've been sitting on this one for a while, right? So the the question about of of what makes a life virtuous for for Plato, I mean, putting aside all of the discussion of habit, virtuous habits to cultivate virtuous character, so on and so forth. One of the things that strikes me about John's question is that um, for for humans, things become meaningful as the uh, out of the outcome of transactions with an environment, including a social environment which emerges from the appropriation of certain biophysical transactions with, with our broader natural environment. So insofar as your question, John, is, you know, what is the, what is the reward mechanism for, for virtue? Like you cannot consider a reward mechanism for virtue outside of the entire web of meanings that enables something like virtue to be taken as value. I don't think it's the right question at all. I don't think so, it's saying, you know, I don't know. It's what cheese is the moon made out of. I just feel like it's the wrong framework entirely to ask certain questions of this kind. I think it's great for foraging on Mars with sparse food. I just don't think it's the framework for what you're discussing. I think we just have to accept that we're going to need different concepts and different frameworks for slightly different domains of behavior. I have an aversion in general to totalizing frameworks. They've never worked, not even in mathematics, right? In other words, you know, the, the you know, Russell and Whitehead's project came a cropper. So I am just somewhat concerned when something that works for, you know, Pac-Man and mazes is suddenly promoted to explaining things like that. I think we have a long, long, long way to go. So I, I agree. Yeah, but I, I don't actually think any of these, and I could be mistaken, I don't actually think any of these papers aim at um, providing a convincing explanation for things like virtue or the reward mechanism for, for virtue. Um, if they do, then I'm, I'm like on, on your side, we don't have a robust framework or a framework robust enough to do that or we need other kinds of um, other kinds of frameworks but my my main point here is is something that Jovo keeps asking in the chat how do we get meaning from from evolution right but one of the things we have to understand is that the the, the very meaning making structures that we are dealing with emerge through our transactions with the environments and these transactions include things like reinforcement learning right I and mean, things like other uh, other modes of learning and other structures that we're talking about here. How these structures are embedded or embodied within a given cultural framework, I think there's a big dis di or there's a big distance between the structures and and how they 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 manifest in culture. But I think they're all in some ways part of culture. So um, this is a long way of saying you're asking questions of a framework that the framework is not interested in answering, at least not yet. Unless somebody, uh, unless somebody wants to correct me on this, right? I'm not entirely certain that these kinds of frameworks are intended to address the questions of uh, how do we find some concepts meaningful, or how do we, One uh, of, you know, determine the of AGI, the, depending on how you see, is how we have everyday folk psychological concepts, right? And to the degree that virtue may qualify as that or not, but 
AGI, one of the things is how do we have our everyday common sense concepts that we live by? That is one of the goals of AGI. Yeah, I think that, I mean, I think that's a mistaken goal. Like, you, I, I don't think you should ask a machine how to get platonic virtue, right? Because a machine does not exist in the same social, cultural, broad context in which we do. You might get a machine's uh, idea of what platonic virtue is, and that may or may not match up with what humans think. But if that, I, and I, I you know, I don't think that should be a goal of AGI, but if that is a goal of AGI, then there, there are other kinds of questions that need asking. But all I'm saying is I, I think that uh, I'm generally of the perspective that I don't know that these frameworks are the right tools to answer the questions that you and I are posing. And if they are being deployed in this way, then we have to have other kinds of conversations. Zena, Rosa, Tim, who's uh, We have a full room. Rosa was saying something interesting in the chat, so I would love it if, Rosa, do you want to verbalize it? Sorry, sorry, I, 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 I just think really, really, really congratulations on a fantastic year, or, and I, so I've got a, I've got a, I've had a long evening and I'm going to head off. Uh, but, but, um, thanks very much indeed for inviting me on a few times and for, and for having just a brilliant, Thing this year, so yeah, congrats, and, and I'll, 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 I'll see, see you when we're over. Thank you, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Rosa, go ahead. Sorry, I'm not sure which thing you wanted. Uh, Maybe to say there are some. I had some earlier questions for Melanie, but she's gone now. <laughs> I was hoping she could tell us where meaning comes from. Um, uh, I, I had some questions about the difference between, I don't know, what I think of as internal reward versus external reward, um, but that maybe um, Ida could answer. So it seems like we talk of, you know, we talk about things in the environment as being rewarding. Oh, we talk about reward signals coming from the environment, but there's also this um, concept of internal reward, I guess, which is like some internal process that reinforces earlier processes or earlier behavior. Um, and I, it seems like those are different things. And it also seems like when we call something like dopamine um, a reward signal, we're talking about something that's internal rather than something that's external, but it's only a reward signal because of the functional role that it plays. Um, with respect to external things and internal things. So I guess I'm having trouble sort of keeping all of these uh, lined up and figuring, figuring out like which things necessarily go with each other and which things only so if we're, go with each other. Coherently, so if we're able to coherently ask the question, like um, this thing is rewarding, but it doesn't lead to good outcomes or it, um, it doesn't functionally lead to me learning things. Does it still count as reward in that context? Like, like what are the constraints on this concept? So um, there can be a chair outside of me, uh, like outside my head, and I can see that chair and there can be, I can have a retina and visual cortex and those sort of internal apparatus allow me to perceive this chair and if uh, you there's some parts of my brain that are damaged then i can't perceive it visually um, maybe i can touch it and then perceive it but i can't no longer perceive it visually if some parts of my brain are damaged likewise there are some things in the world like food like friends like good books or good movies, or the salon, that are objectively rewarding, <laughs> externally rewarding. And I might uh, have to register it using some circuitry inside my brain. So it could be that based on changes in dopamine, I might register that this is a rewarding stimuli. Like the first time I accidentally stumble upon Crowdcast and I'm like, what is this? What is going on? What are these people saying? Why are they so rude? And then I figure out, oh, this is super rewarding, actually. And I'm like, expand some, some, for some reason, I experience something. That um, a, a moment fr from which, after which in evolution, some creatures started to be able to sense their internal state, it didn't happen from the beginning. So 
Um, I really appreciated um, uh, the talk that was given by um, uh, Paul Chizik yesterday, and uh, like he mentions this in his book. Uh, it's after a particular time where expansion happens. So you have from the time that you have, uh, if I, uh, I'm gonna uh, sort of put it in the chat, chordates, I think that's how you pronounce them. Since you have, this is the, uh, I will send the link to Chizik talk because he gives many different versions, but the one yesterday in the, the sort of the talk series we had, uh, Evolving Neural Networks, I really appreciated it. So uh, that's when uh, the, the, they move from simple foraging, they form something that looks like a hypothalamus and spinal cord, and then start to have a dopamine dependent search. So since that's like an early organism, uh, since which we have dopamine, which is very early actually. And uh, from then on, uh, so gradually you have the escape circuit and the approach circuit. And then at some point, um, there is the ability to uh, sense sort of internal states. And I think like, for instance, that dopamine would kind of register what's going on. And then at some point he was mentioning that you also get something that says, oh, this is super good. Like there is different kinds of internal states reacting to the world. And based on those internal states, one starts to, um, the, the organism starts to sort of decide what to do. And if you look at Peter Godfrey Smith's books, and there are also particular periods where there is a lot of neural networks and complexity increases just for coordinating the newly formed multicellular organism. So there are some parts uh, that are formed just so that they form an internal sense of what is going on in all of these cells, bundle of cells, uh, a kind of a unified sense of what is going on in all of this, like good, bad, maybe sort of, and that's kind of something that is being registered. And that does, is not there in bacteria. It happens much later on. So external reward could be the food gradient that the bacterial moves towards, but the internal registering of something about the external state uh, might be that when, when dopamine sort of starts to emerge, for instance, and then, uh, and then later on, I think that there is, it's not just, it's not just dopamine, he, he mentioned that there is like a little bit further where you, uh, where this sense of like kind of proprioception emerges. And then with tetrapods, he suggests that there's affordances that emerge, et cetera. So we can, he, he discusses these things. Now, whether we agree or disagree with Paul's specific trajectory, I think it's a very useful way to think about what happened in the course of evolution in terms of this notion of external and internal states. And what I'm trying to say is that, so for instance, the kinds of models that we are developing right now that they do homeostatic meta-learning, what they do is they learn that internal uh, shape, the, the, the shape of that internal state space, and you want to maintain some kind of an internal state space. And what you interact with the world is to maintain, a, to remain in a particular part of that uh, internal homeostatic sort of ideal state, and not go too far towards a place that is gonna kill you, for instance. How does that happen? By the same way that, you know, I, if I experience a change in the environment, there might be some dopamine. If I don't register the change, uh, if there might be a change in the world and I don't register because my, for whatever reason, my dopamine didn't flux properly, um, then I just miss that change and that might be bad for my survival, right? Um, there's some internal states or internal state space that I keep track on and I also interact, other parts of my brain would keep track on what's going on in the world. And by maintaining some kind of a equilibrium between the two, I manage to stay alive or I manage to define new goals or whatever while staying within some kind of a reasonable homeostatic state. Um, but then if you push me too much to hunger and fear and whatever, I might just do things that are, have nothing to do with me or how I would recognize myself uh, because this is just like a state where uh, my model of the world is not defined for, for instance, which happens, for instance, sorry to say this, but in torture situations, this is what happens to people. Like they push people to a point where they're not prepared and sort of uh, for, for enduring all that and maintaining their human concepts of what they wanna share or not share with the interrogator, for instance, right? So those are, or, or with animals, when they wanna test, unfortunately, psychiatric models on animals, they will push the animal to corner, it's dark, they will put a predator next to it, or they would shock it, or they would sort of randomly turn off and on the lights until the animal is out of its equilibrium for maintaining its homeostasis, it might get into kind of freezing or whatnot, right? So this internal state and external state, maintaining a kind of uh, interaction between the two emerges at some point in evolution. And I think that's what we need to figure out for, you know, wow, that's very beautiful, the external world and hi, <laughs> fantastic. 
That's a very good balcony. I'm very envious of this house now. <laughs> um, uh, I'm actually gonna have to go. Um, so uh, we're hitting six. I promised we go. We, uh, uh, Ida was right that we that we were not gonna get past. We were gonna go past five thirty. Um, but uh, do I do? do, I, do we, should we just keep going and I'll, I'll, I'll go or, or Zena? Yeah, I think we should keep going and hear from Zena. We wish okay. you could stay longer. All right, I'll, I'll go, go ahead, Zena. Hi. <laughs> um, can you hear me? Don't be offended when I suddenly vanish. It's got nothing to do with what you're saying. Right. Can you hear yeah. me? Okay. Cool. I, you know, I didn't actually have that many thoughts on on RL. I'm not an RL person, but I have a few a few thoughts. Um, my first is that I haven't actually read the DeepMind paper, but it seems to me that there's many different questions that are being asked, and they're not, they're not all the same question, right? So I think perhaps the least controversial is the question of can we build intelligent agents using just RL? And um, I don't know if that's true, but I wouldn't I wouldn't bet against it. Right, I think this is an empirical question which will be borne out with evidence. Wait, are you against it because you're Bayesian and not versed in RL, or are you against it because you have read the paper and you have reasoning against it? Those are different. No, I, no, said, I, 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 haven't, I haven't read the paper. paper. And I, I, I'm not saying I'm, I said I wouldn't bet against it. Ah, sorry, I totally misheard you. Right, I apologize. Uh, uh, um, yeah, I wouldn't bet against it. I think there are probably other ways to build AGI, but. Um, I could, I could conceive of a future where people, you know, invest really heavily in RL and build a AGI through RL. Um, I think the other questions that are being asked are perhaps more interesting, which is that, can we understand uh, intelligence through the lens of RL? And I think I would probably um, echo some of John's comments in the sense that I think, you know, RL is not a good explanation of many of the things that we do. Um, I think it's a good explanation of um, perhaps the learning component, but it doesn't explain you know the the post learn state for many of our of our activities. So just as a pu purely explanatory device, I don't think it would be sufficient as a framework. Sorry, to... just to understand. So mm -hmm. you're saying you wouldn't bet against RL reaching AGI, but you don't think RL is the right framework to explain intelligence. Those two sentences seem contradictory. No, no I, I think we can learn through an RL style process in, in a similar way to what you were talking about earlier. That doesn't mean RL is a, a good explanatory device to understand um, all of intelligence. So to be, okay. Uh, so, so reward doesn't equal RL. What we were discussing so far was whether reward is enough. You could have reinforcement learning approaches that don't have a reward function defined and they can learn the reward function some, some other way. What you are saying seems to be you're claiming RL is not, reinforcement learning is not sufficient for intelligence, not reward is not sufficient for intelligence, which is what we were saying before. I think, I think in case, case, to give a very concrete example, let's say 3D vision, like how I can interpret the three-dimensional world um, from what I see. So the question is, is either RL or reward, a good framework for you know, explaining that. And I think there are other frameworks, you know, the whole of computer vision, which offer a more compelling foundation for understanding and explaining that. And that's, that's, that's the of science. science. Sorry, what is the reason that other frameworks are more, okay. I feel like we went somewhere else. Let's, <laughs> um, uh, you're saying there is, you're saying RL is not a good framework for explaining intelligence. That's your claim. I, I, I don't think I'm making, making a very, very um, controversial claim. claim. All I'm saying is, is that the components of intelligence, intelligence which, which can be can understood, we... sorry, there's a large echo, but there are components of intelligence which RL is not the best explanatory framework to, to describe it. That's what like, what? like what? Like what? as the example I just gave you, vision. So, so you, may, may, you may say that we learn to see through some evolutionary, evolutionary process of, of you know, RL, style pro, RL style process, but I don't think 
reward is necessarily the framework in which we should understand, you know, vision. Does anybody else want to take this? Yeah, I, so I'm so there. There are two things that I'm kind of stuck on, and this might be uh, the the philosopher in me coming out. So you're saying reward is not sufficient enough to explain vision, but when you're talking about vision, do you mean vision in the in terms of the the mechanical processes whereby we see things in the world and thus have eyes and navigate, or do you mean vision in terms of I see a color and I call it red, or I see a can and I know that it is a, a can, or I see a book and I understand it to be a book, right? So we these are, I mean, they're both tied together, but they're two different kinds of things, right? So I'm not entirely certain what you mean by, by vision when you're saying reinforcement learning cannot explain vision. If you're saying RL can't merely explain how we see, then sure, right, that's optometry. There, there are other fields that engage in the, the structures of our our you know our visual senses right if you're saying rl can't explain why i see the color red and can call it red then you're gonna have to you're gonna have to unpack that just a little bit more for me because i'm still stuck on what you mean by vision and and where where how that's working here right right so so i was i was talking more about the latter of your examples right so your examples were, more, were somewhat about classification but i was talking also about 3D vision, right? So how I come to conceive of the geometry of an object, right, from, from a 2D image that I'm receiving. And so my claim is not that RL cannot explain. My claim is more that it's, you know, it's not a particularly useful explanation or explanatory framework for thinking about three-dimensional vi vision, for example, right? Or, um, or to, to switch the argument, like, why would you want to think about vision in these terms? Like, what does that, what does that buy you? So it's, it's less it's about, about the mecha mechanism by which, uh, uh, you know, vision came to be in either humans or, or you know, other agents. I'm just talking about as an explanatory framework. So I think this is just basically John's argument that you can learn things, and once you've learned them, either on an individual scale or an evolutionary scale, you can understand them within, within a framework which may not be exactly how you came to acquire that piece of knowledge or that or that skill. I don't think I understand what you're saying, but I will open it up to Jovo and Rosa. Well, yeah, I'm not sure I entirely understand Dennis' point either. I'm just kind of guessing in the chat. Um, because, you know, he and I have a very different background, but my perspective is RL has great explanatory power first at some level of cognition and intelligence, and there's other levels of explanation that I desire that I don't think the notion of reward is going to do it for me. That doesn't mean it won't do it for other people, but that's 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 for a person. And so... Uh, Sorry, no, again, no. reward or RL? These are different things. I Which one? One. You Okay, you're using them interchangeably? In this, sense, in this current sentence, I'm saying neither reward nor RL for me right now is the level of explain is all levels of explanation of cognition and perception? I think the which all, modeling all framework does have that. None, None of, them. of them. Okay, they're, they're all, all them. Okay. They're all they're valuable, all. and they all provide some level of explanation, and the other ones provide other levels, and that's great. So let's talk about something that we can distinguish different modeling frameworks. If if all of them can't accept, achieve this, then let's. Okay, let's put that aside. Let's go to something that maybe some of them can and some of them can't, but not sure if this is the, so it's, it's already 6.15, so I wanna make sure that we have like a fruitful and sort of a, a, a discussion that, it, that leads to something. So, um, uh, so I think to summarize the, the discussion with Melanie, um, there are particular, so, and also I think what Zena is saying is what I initially thought he was saying, <laughs> which is uh, RL can't explain it by some, but some other can explain it, some other computational framework. No, so so why why single out RL if all computational frameworks can't can't explain it? Just so I understand. I'm not singling out RL. This is the, <laughs> the topic of the conversation. So the question that I have is, what is the claim being discussed? Right. This is the main thing. Like when we say. RL is all we need. 
No, we didn't say RL is what we need. Okay, it was reward on. is all we need, which is reward is enough, which is a different story, which means approaches in reinforcement learning, some not all approaches in reinforcement learning rely on you explicitly justifying rewards. Some of them could be learning what the rewards are or what the surface is. What they are saying is that any notion of intelligence, you can learn it if you define a reward function that's good enough. Then you can capture it and the machine. And what do they mean? These are, again, as we discussed, these are computer scientists. What they mean is we define a particular task that is the benchmark for intelligence. If you define the correct reward, there would be an RL algorithm that can sort of achieve that, which is a much more confined claim. They're not saying reinforcement learning can capture AG. Like, that's not the point. The point is they're making a much more fine grained point even within reinforcement learning. At least that's how I understood it, uh, or at least that's how I was discussing it. And the discussion that we were making is what other approaches, whether within reinforcement learning or outside of reinforcement learning, can get inspired by the evolution of rewards, either as priors inside architectures or as things that are learned socially during one's life. Whether it's reinforcement learning or other machine learning approach, what can they do to acquire this part? So I feel like we might be talking about different things. Sure, perhaps. <laughs> I feel like I, said, I haven't read the paper, so um, I don't have any strong comments on the paper's claims. So, Rosa is saying, I, I, I'm looking at what you re wrote last, Rosa, which is evolution is sufficient to produce to in produce intelligence but we would like a more detailed story about exactly how that happened and what role reward played in it. And I, I, I would love it if you expand on that more, but I feel like we actually need to understand how rewards evolve themselves, like the notion of reward or something like that, especially in different kinds of learning or neural architectures. So I'd love it if you say a little bit more. I think it's similar to what you said earlier in the discussion, and I appreciated this point. Yeah, I think I am making a very similar point. So if you say something like reward is enough for intelligence, I think that's very similar to saying evolution is enough for intelligence and evolution is enough for intelligence, uh, but it doesn't yet explain how it is that we came to be intelligent. We want a more detailed story about how that works. And I think you could say the same thing about reward. Maybe reward is enough for intelligence, but we want to know something, we want to know like a more articulated story about exactly what role it plays in generating intelligence and how we can use it to produce intelligence. So I guess that was the first point. Um, the, I guess there's a, there are some related questions about, um, okay, well, may, maybe I'll, I'll say something about what you, you just said. So this question about how, um, how reward even managed to evolve. So, it seems like if we understand reward as this very general thing as like some kind of reinforcement mechanism, some kind of mechanism that makes it possible for the creature to do something different in the future than it did in the past, um, then there are forms of reinforcement for any creature that um, behaves differently as a result of experience, including bacteria. Um, if you want to rule that out as a kind of reward, then we need to say something more specific about what the functional role of reward is. Um, like, does it have to be part of a specialized system that is, um, whose sole purpose is learning? Does it have to be like domain general learning? Um, does it have to be, I think this is related to the questions that we were talking about with, um, with Sam Gershman. It seems like uh, one way to pick out like a more specific notion of reward is to tie it more closely uh, to a more sophisticated notion of learning, for example. Um, so, so maybe um, I'd be curious, like what what you think when what you're thinking of when you say, you know, how did reward evolve? Uh, so that's a good question. So it's similar to what I was mentioning earlier about Paul Chizek's work, where he shows at which stage in evolutionary sort of um, hierarchy. Uh, uh, of like, you know, branching off of different sort of species after single cells, uh, at which point is there an internal uh, state? At some point there is an internal state 
and that internal state uh, has to then the animal does things to maintain something about that internal state maintain it within survival maintain it within homeostasis now you can think about various frameworks that one can discuss it and that requires certain priors to come about for instance that's what i that's that's what i had in mind so, so internal, internal state, state is, is anything, anything that um anything that's history dependent uh, no, it could be, it's bad, I'm going to die soon, or it's good, I'm going to survive, or it could be, I need to change something, things are really wrong, or I'm doing great, <laughs> I should keep going. Like, uh, so something that's that's that like an internal motivation, motivation that, that produces behavior that's, that's not stimulus driven? Great question. So it's, it does change with what happens in the world. So if the stimulus is food, and I'm hungry, that internal state is hunger. So if, imagine hunger, pain, but simplified version of them. Uh, internal good, internal bad, right? So that kind, or, or some kind of a scale, which could be maybe measured by sort of uh, changes in it could be measured by some internal sort of, uh, I'm trying to read the chat at the same time, so I'm sorry, I think I lost the trace of that sentence. But uh, so yeah, so imagine how did we evolve hunger or how did we evolve pain? These are much more um, abstract concepts because it's more human or maybe more mammalian. Earlier, earlier than this, there was a sense of internal states, not proprioception in the sense that, oh, what is my body temperature right now? Or what is my internal sugar level? But something sim much more simplified version of that. At some point that, uh, that sort of generated and you would just move around in the environment and interact with things that improve that thing that's inside, that kind of a, uh, yeah, yeah I, um, so, 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 so like, like hunger, hunger, is there a difference between uh, hunger and just uh, having low internal energy stores? In one sense, you uh, experience it, you sense it. Sense and the it. Other, so, so, so it has to be the um, input into some kind of system that's right. uh, that, that exactly right. controls, controls the kind the of behavior, behavior you use. Control is the keyword. You use exactly the keyword that uh, Paul uses, uh, Godfrey Smith uses, which is there is some internal signal that translates into some control. Um, and the control is how to control the movements and sensing, uh, the sensory motor control, so that you can survive or maintain homeostasis, for instance, right? Yeah, yeah so, so I think. think I think control is the key word, but control is another one of these terms that I think uh, ends up getting co-defined with reward and goal and normative things when, when you touch on it, right? Because, because what's, what's the difference it? between control and merely having an effect? If my internal energy stores are depleted, that will have an effect on my behavior, um, um, even, even if, if there isn't some specialized system for monitoring my internal, internal state. state. Great. That's so a random, that, that could be a random control system. Yeah. So okay. whether your control module is dumb or smart is another issue. Uh, what it does, what's the circuitry of that control, obviously it gets more. So that's, uh, for instance, in, in earlier systems, even before this in an internal sensing is there, there's just a gradient. The only sensor that this sort of has is, is there a gradient to food or not? And I want to move in the direction that there is more gradient of food. Otherwise, I'm going to move randomly. That's the only thing that exists, right? That's the simplest form that that was. And then gradually over time, it gets more complex. Um, so on. anything that has an effect is a control? No, no. I don't know what effect means. So it's, again, so you and I, we have different toolboxes. You use words. Words are for me just a secondary tool. And I'm, I'm thinking some equation or some particular thing in this exp in this creature, in this sort of uh, uh, biological organism or other, right? So control or, or in some, whether you have it in engineering or whether you have it in a creature that has multiple cells, it needs to be able to move the creature, for instance, or change something about the creature in a way that it will change its state, right? So I don't think the term effect is enough because um, I could, for instance, so there are many things that could have an effect, but they might not change the state. So like, I, I'm not sure what effect means. And I, it's not a terminology that either uh, on the engineering, control theory, neuroscience, or whatever we use in that meaning. So that's part of the reason. So I'm saying it might be that you're saying the same thing, but because my tools is not words and something else, it might appear like we're not saying the same thing. I but think I'm asking, asking for, for clarification. clarification. Okay. Because so I wanted, wanted to, to understand um, what the, 
I wanted to understand what the difference is between an organism that gets around in the world, a simple organism that gets around effectively in the world and, uh, you know, behaves differently on the basis of experience. What the difference is between that organism and one that does have a control system or that does have internal reward and that and does have state. And, and so it's, it's like the, the difference, difference between, between a creature is. that has state and a creature that doesn't is the one that has a control system versus one that doesn't. No, I'm saying the one that has a control system has more cells. You can oh, be a okay. single cell organism. As soon as you have multiple limbs and sensory input, you need something, some, some more circuitry to, to coordinate, coordinate them. them. And that's what Godfrey Smith, for instance, says. And his explanation is that initially one, cell, one, one, in one, t one single cell thing goes and eats another one and it becomes two, two cells. And then like gradually you have multiple cell things, right? And then it survives, therefore it gets, and then gradually all of a sudden it, it evolves some other kind of sensory thing, which is maybe like more visual or it's better at detecting. It's not just sensitive to gradients of food and um, excrement of others, uh, which is for social uh, finding of things. And then gradually it, 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 it evolves some things on the side that if it, if it moves, it can swim in different directions. And so it can control the direction of its swimming more, for instance, right? And then gradually, as these things are more, uh, then it, it needs some kind of a, a internal control mechanism to synchronize them so that it can move in a direction like they don't move in different directions and it make it because uh, it's very easy, as, as you would see, for instance, in a seizure. The limbs, if the limbs are not working in, 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 co in coordination with one another and they get too synchronized, so too simplistic. Um, then we lose control in the sense that it, we can't move in any direction. It's not paralysis. It's, it's a little worse than paralysis even. Um, so those kinds of situations, um, when you have more cells and more motor sensory things to handle, then you need some way to coordinate them. And so that could be one of the reasons that there was some internal state uh, to sort of uh, maybe, and that's part of, uh, uh, and so Paul Chizik's work uh, was talking about the situation where there is all of a sudden spinal cord developing and dopamine emerging. So dopamine could, for instance, help with that because it could just like, um, it, I don't want to use the word broadcast because that word is associated with consciousness theory, so I'm not going to say that, but coordinate, maybe that's a better word. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. It seems like, um, I mean, I would have thought that these theories were actually uh, competitors with each other. This idea of nervous systems as being there for coordination of, um, I don't know, like the motor plant um, on the one hand and the nervous system as a kind of uh, representational thing that's supposed to help uh, mediate between sensation and action. So... Yes, there are two, you're totally right that there are two competing theories that have a different idea of what a nervous system is for. But we're not just talking about the nervous system, right? We are talking also about, for instance, dopamine function. And so uh, it wasn't the case that the nervous system for coordination of action and dopamine were opposing theories. So that's a different. I think that you're totally right that there were two different kind of theories. Whether it's for coordination versus another one, I don't remember right now. But I, but they haven't that they, they have like names That's that are represented. Uh, but then the 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 one that I'm mentioning uh, is also what uh, what um, uh, what I put in the chat uh, the name of those organisms that I keep forgetting their name um, that um, uh, Paul Chizik mentions when there is all of a sudden a kind of a hypothalamus. We're all yeah, it. yeah, there you go. Uh, and then hypothalamus, I, I never know how to pronounce it. Can you pronounce it again? Cordates, right? Oh, so it, I am pronouncing it right. I was like, maybe there's some other pronunciation. Um, so uh, there is, um, right, there is, they, there is all of a sudden a kind of a hypothalamus, a kind of a spinal cord. There is a kind of a, a dopamine function. And so then you gradually over time, I don't know if it's exactly at chordates or later on that there is this idea that you would have to sense the internal, so there is some kind of internal, keeping track of internal state. Um, and I think that's different from just like this and the, the purposes of the sensory monitor system. <laughs> this child is wonderful, by the way. Um, <laughs> does that explain it? Yeah, yeah I, think I think that helps. So does that, does that capture what I mean by instead of having the notion of reward, having the notion of some kind of an internal landscape that you're trying to maintain somewhere 
And then you're interacting with the world in ways that you will maintain yourself within a particular radius of, let's say, homeostasis for the, your internal state. So the, so the internal, internal state, state is not, not supposed to mirror the external state. It's, it's that's right. It's not about representation. But it's responsive, responsive to it. So let's say that the internal state is how much sugar there is in my blood. And then um, when the sugar goes down, uh, but I could do many different things in the world randomly. At some point, I realized that when I eat chocolate, all of a sudden that sort of internal turmoil just like calms down. <laughs> um, <laughs> it would be that my friends figure it out and keep giving me chocolates when I get like <laughs> fuzzy. So, but um, the point is that um, the, it's not the representation of chocolate that matters at that point. It's just whatever is going on somewhere else in some other module of the brain. Maybe it's a representation learning module. Maybe it's a model free module. Maybe it's just a random action taking module, whatever it is. Uh, the outcome of it or the effect of it, as you were saying, would be that I move somewhere in this internal state space to somewhere that's more desirable than where I was before. Right. And by more desirable, I just mean it, it, it seems like it, there's a I don't know if it's like Dewey, to be honest with you, but let's. <laughs> um, but uh, does that make sense? So does this make sense now how this would be different from using reward that the experimenter has defined? Because in the other option, it's like, I'm just going to say you're just going to maximize reward. And then I'm going to define what the reward function is for you by creating a virtual environment and putting rewards there. And all yeah. you need to do is figure out a policy to maximize reward in it. That's like the basic kind of reinforcement learning of the, you know, the, the like old timey kind of the most basic notion of it, which is very much influenced, of course, by con classical conditioning experiments in psychology. If you look at the history, actually, Kate Crawford and I are writing some uh, critical piece about the different um, ideologies, uh, uh, like philosoph philosophical ideologies that, that, that are in three different generations of reinforcement learning. So this earlier one is a little bit more on the behaviorist side. It's a little bit more, it has that kind of a flavor. But then you have some that are cognitivist. Something is being learned in the middle. It can be representation learning. It can be learning a transition function. It could be that um, we need some, and, and there's a third generation that I'm distinguishing, but like let, let, let's talk about it when the paper is there. Hi, <laughs> mini scientists. <laughs> And then um, at some point, uh, I think it would be important to think about how, how is this internal state and its relationship to that other module, which is learning something about the external world, how is that, uh, how can we build models that has that relationship? So that's the new suggestion that I'm trying to make. And that internal state is not a representation of the external world. It's the summary of how close I am to losing my uh, homeostatic equilibrium, if that makes sense. Does it make sense? It's an interesting idea. Yeah. I, know, I would just say, I think that was a really beautiful explanation um, and summary of like a lot of works spanning many different fields. I'm so grateful that you just explained it all, especially to my daughter who can witness women who are brilliant and powerful and expressive sharing and teaching the world about things they know. It's really awesome. What is your daughter's name? Her full name is Shoshana Malka Violet Sky Owl, but she goes by Owl. Tell them your name. name. Owl. Hi, Owl. <laughs> How old are you, Owl? Owl. Owl. <laughs> Owl. She's 20 months. Oh, wow. So almost three years old. <laughs> Coming up. up. The reason I'm saying this is that it, children at this age, usually up their age, you, you, you ask them how old are you and they say I'm three and they're actually like 22 months old or something. <laughs> That's the reason I was saying that. She is wise well beyond her months. Exactly, exactly. Um, that's, that's how you know uh, somebody is a parent when they may explain age in months as opposed to years. <laughs> Uh, sorry, Rosa, you were saying, oh, Montreal, you can maybe bring Montreal now that we have room on stage. Did we lose Rosa?
Thanks, Rosa. I think that we should probably soon wrap up, and I can't believe I again said all of that on tape. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm very sad that John is not here to outro us, because usually he's like the perfect outro guy. Also, we're going to come back in August, so it's not like this is entirely over. <laughs> but yeah, Rosa, I think I might have, uh, I, I might need to just write down what I just said, just so that you, you can have something, because I have written a lot of this down, and I might send you something. There is a, um, I wish Rosa was on screen right now, because like, I think I might have accidentally. Um, so I have written some of it down, but we are building a model so that it starts to learn that surface. No, not a medium post. We're actually writing papers. <laughs> we just didn't make it to the NURBS deadline, but we're hoping to make I, it for I, the next ones. I just meant <laughs> like, like quickly, like, like this, this weekend, weekend uh, get, uh, get it written down, down so you can, can see, see it. it. Oh, I do have it written down, but because I'm working on actual papers on this with different collaborators, so there is a group of people for the model that would do this kind of homeostatic meta-learning of the internal shape of rewards. And there is another paper with Kate Crawford, which is these three different sort of cultures of reinforcement learning and their philosophical ideological backgrounds, basically. So the behaviorism, the cognitivism, etc. cetera. Um, so yeah, so I feel like uh, I would want to sort of make sure that uh, it's kind of like conference ready so that, you know, because the, the, the unit of credit for us is the ML conference, so I want to make sure that that works. But I think it would be fun to discuss it further on a medium or other format. I really appreciate um, Rosa asking this back and forth with me because it's really sort of uh, uh, it, it helped for me to see which parts might need more explanation than others and I hope that I can discuss it with you all soon like we should have a salon for half-baked ideas or in-progress ideas where people just like you know do a working paper and like maybe co-author things in an adversarial way um, uh, Zena, so sorry, you, you joined a discussion that was already very deep in and I feel like it wasn't fair to you at all. Like the, <laughs> the discussion was so sort of already like um, uh, maybe a little stage is what is the word saturated already. So I really apologize. I, I really wanted no, to hear from you. No, um, so we need to thank a couple of people. We need to thank Jovo. Thank you so much, Jovo. You were one of the uh, driving engines of the salon. Uh, since the very beginning, um, then you provided resources from your lab, uh, you provided resources for websites, uh, your your students, which was very, very kind of generous, and it, it helped the salon actually work. Kanaka provided resources by having Claire uh, join our team, who was, um, at the time, she was in Kanaka's lab. I don't know if she's still in Kanaka's lab, like, uh, but she is. Um, then uh, we had, uh, of course, Brad, who used to help us with the questions and bringing questions to our attention. And uh, uh, we had Eva, who was actually rotating at the time with uh, Jovo, uh, who was helping us out enormously. Actually, without Eva, I don't think we could have ran this thing because she was the one who knew how to do Crowdcast. We had John, of course, who is the prima donna of the, <laughs> of the salon and without him things are less interesting and he always sort of manages to even in disagreement um, invite others to thinking together with him and bring a community together and we had Melanie and Jonathan Flowers and Tim and all the others who joined us constantly as guests uh, on screen and they really allowed us to in improve the sort of the um, the, the salon. And then recently in the past month, we have one of my old friends, Bahar, who is a neuroscientist turned science writer, very successful science writer, in fact, um, uh, who has been helping us out in the past uh, months and uh, uh, helping us out with so many little things that all of us uh, uh, had become too overwhelmed to be able to manage. And without them, we would not have been able to do this. So this was a neural network, all of us working together there were excitations, inhibitions, adversarial uh, <laughs> attacks, etc. until we managed to kind of sustain an equilibrium of the salon. And I really want to appreciate everyone who joined every week. For me, this was a huge deal because New York City was hit very hard early on in the pandemic and it was super scary and lonely and we had to really isolate ourselves. 
and gradually the salon really helped uh, for first it was the anime and then the salon it really helped to maintain a sense of community in the absence uh, which we hope to keep con keep sort of uh, keep keep uh, uh, fostering and we are writing a neuron paper uh, that is like a review of the salon and the lessons that we learned about this community and we are including some quotes from all of you. So I want to invite anyone who attends the salon, former speakers or attendees, to send us um, if they think some, some things could get done better, if they have a critique, if they have a, um, a positive idea, it's a positive sort of appreciative idea, either of all of those. And maybe we will send you out uh, some, maybe even some forms, uh, so to more systematically get your feedback. Uh, and have an idea of how we can improve. And we hope to return in, in August and maybe maybe not, not super forced, it's the, not full force in August, but like slowly uh, over time. And we have to discuss how we're gonna manage now that the world is returning to in-person. Um, yeah, Jovo, do you wanna say a couple of words? Yes, yeah, several. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Ida, for, well, everything, but including the last few minutes of thanking people. Uh, I I want to also thank Worldwide Neuro for providing the platform and Crowdcast that we use. And of course, the person I want to express the most gratitude of all to is you, Ida. Without you, there would have never been a salon. And I know, and mostly everyone else doesn't know, the extent of energy you've invested, personal, professional, everything, every week, choosing speakers, emailing speakers, coordinating everything. It was a tremendous amount of energy. Everyone here is so grateful that it happened, but I'm specifically grateful because I know how much energy you invested to make it happen and that it would not have happened without all of that. Um, also grateful, of course, to John um, for doing so much and all of the people who participated and joined the screen and uh, contributed in the chat and the Twitter discussions and all of that. I've learned so much this year through the salon, not just about how to be a better scientist, but how to be a better member of a community, how to be a better ally, I hope. Uh, I believe I'm a better person now because of the salon and largely because of Ida's influence. Um, she's, it's so, it's really an honor to be around her. I, I get so much from it. It's really great. Um, and John and everybody, but I've been really impressed with Ida specifically. So I just wanna say it's been amazing. And yeah, you know, we're, there's a session in August. I'm trying to work around family vacation stuff in August, and then we'll see what happens next year. There's so many beautiful places to go, and things will be different next year. So um, I'm excited about openness and possibilities for the future um, and being in this community that's been created now, which is really so helpful for me to be a part of. Um, and I'm so grateful to everyone that it's here. I have learned so much at the salon. It's, it would be an a understatement. And I feel like when I make summaries, people can see. I really absorb things that people say, and I remember it because it matters to me. So I want to thank everyone. I, I've learned so much. And thank you, Jovo, for the kind words. Um, I really appreciate it. And yeah, let's hope that we can maintain some version of the salon it could be like not maybe every week but like i hope that we can maintain some version of the salon and the community um uh, because i think it's been constructive i think one important thing for us has been to make sure that um junior and minority voices and diverse disciplinary voices are heard in the same forum so that it's not just neuroscientists talking about neurons and psychologists separately talking about psych and philosophers separately and ml separately I think our, our, our aspiration and your aspiration also, Jovo, was to have a kind of a mixed interdisciplinary, real interdisciplinary discussion. And I really want to thank everyone who um, made this possible because it was only possible due to frequent attendees from various disciplines and their openness to talk to each other. I think a very interesting moment. I wish John was here to hear this, but like for me, it was, it was like this moment, for instance, in Andrew Whiten's session. His language was the language of talking in terms of animal examples. My language was the language of talking in terms of models, computational framework. Uh, Flower's language was talking in terms of philosophy, and John was talking in a different language. At some point, John detected that the 
miscommunication is because of not translating. So he started translating his thoughts into examples of animal interactions to Andrew. And I feel like that moment I just saw, I felt it like, oh, if we just figure out how to translate to each other's language, and if we spend a little bit of time, then all of a sudden things become more understandable. And I think that was a lesson I learned from John, that sometimes you need to speak the language that the other person can understand, or translate your words to a language the other person can understand for things to work. Which is ironic because my mother tongue is Farsi. I'm also speaking in English to all of you. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of uh, being able to translate across uh, conceptual language, thinking languages. And I feel like until the salon, I haven't felt it so viscerally, the fact that different people have different thinking languages or different languages of thoughts, not to, not to say, not to evoke Fodor. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone. What is a good outright? I wish we had a sound that could be the da, da, da or something. I don't know. We are the champions. I don't know what would be a good song for the outro. <laughs> Maybe some dolphins. Some what? Some, some dolphins making a sway or an octopus. Or octopus, yes. Yeah. So can everybody who's still here maybe put an animal in the chat that's their favorite animal? I'm going to put an octopus myself. And yeah, maybe we can see how many different animals we can get. I can't find the icon. Let's hope. I see a unicorn. I'm, I'm leaving a unicorn for John. And then trying to find an octopus. Yeah, the learning salon has been about different species, different, uh, whether biological or computational. So it makes sense to end it with uh, <laughs> emojis of different species. Computers do. That's right. Robot. Nobody's gonna. Interesting. Looking at all the things that exist. <laughs> all right. Do you guys want to say something? Flowers, Zena. All right. With that. Uh, uh, oh, go on. No, I. No, I. I just want to echo how thankful I am for having this space where folks from multiple disciplines can come together and talk about our perspectives on generally the same topics. And we should, and I wish there were more spaces like this in across disciplines. Let's make them. All right. Bye, everyone. Have a great weekend. Happy Juneteenth. Happy Pride. Bye. See you soon. Bye. 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 Let's see how long this goes. Bye. 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 What's your favorite color? No. So. That's awesome. I love blue too. Perfect. <laughs>